Virtual reality will grow, just as the telegraph grew to the telephone, as the radio to the TV. It will be everywhere. I'm going back to VSI to complete the final stage of my evolution. I'm going to project myself into the mainframe computer. I'll become pure energy. Once I've entered in the neural net, my birth cry will be the sound of every phone on this planet ringing in unison. We, we keep our phones on silent. Pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. <laughs> Good one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Good times. Anyway, my name is William Bibiani. <laughs> I'm a film critic for the internet, for IGN, The Wrap, and criticallyacclaimed.net. Everybody calls me Bibs. My name is Whitney Seibold. I, too, am a film critic for the internet, including criticallyacclaimed.net. Yes, that, our new website. That's our new website. Yeah, in case you haven't checked it out yet, maybe you missed the last episode or two, we have a new po- we have a new website, criticallyacclaimed.net. It's where you can find all our content from throughout the internet and original content, your review of Jurassic mm. World 2. Is uh, or Jurassic Park I, 4? It's Jurassic Park 5. It should okay. be called Jurassic Park 5, but for some reason Jurassic World was considered part 1, even though it's directly in the same continuity and the same characters appear. Well, the original Jurassic Park was a prequel trilogy. Oh, uh, was it? I don't fucking know. Can you never say the phrase prequel trilogy to me again? I would very much like to be able to never <laughs> or, say the words prequel trilogy. Or, or interquel. If you say interquel to me, I'm going to slap you in the <laughs> face. But that's what Fast and Furious mm. 4 through 6 were. Uh-huh. They were interquels. An interquel. Is, is it interquel or is it interquel? Interquel. Interquel. Yeah. Right. It's like you don't say quadrilogy. It's quadrilogy. Okay. You're not allowed to ever <laughs> say the word quadrilogy. <laughs> say tetrad. Say tetralogy. Those are words. Quadrilogy is made up BS. Anyway. Well, yeah. Now that there are more than four alien movies. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's also Prometheus and there's also Covenant. And there's yeah, and the Alien vs. Predator uh, movies. Alien, which people don't really count. But they that's count. All right. They have aliens in them. They count. Yeah, they, and we, moving on. They're, they're also bad. Criticallyacclaimed.net. <laughs> www.criticallyacclaimed.net. We have a lot of cool stuff there. And if you want to tell us what to write on that website, you go to our Patreon page. Patreon.com slash cancelled too soon. Uh, mm-hmm. You help contribute to the Cancel Too Soon podcast, get bonus podcasts mm-hmm. as well, exclusive content we don't release anywhere else on the internet, and you can force us to write the articles you want us to write at criticallyclaimed.net. So check That's that right. out. You, you get to be the editor. But you enough get... enough shilling. <laughs> enough shilling. <laughs> enough shilling. On to Taylor Shilling. Ah. Well, she's not in any of the movies this No, week, but I so. like her a lot as an actor. I think she's yeah. good. She, uh, she started out in that crappy Atlas Shrugged movie, and then she did okay she after that. She was in stuff before that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just... not her fault. <laughs> Atlas Shrugged is not her fault. Atlas Shrugged is the fault of the people who made Atlas Shrugged. Uh, uh, but she was one of those people. Well, okay, it's All not right. her exclusive fault. <laughs> the movies aren't great. Anyway, moving on. This week, got a whole bunch of stuff we're reviewing on Critically Acclaimed. We're reviewing Ocean's 8, Hereditary, Hotel Artemis, and Bernard and Huey. That's not Bernard the movie and Huey the movie. That's Bernard and Huey one movie. Mm. Uh, and we're also going to be... Is it re- about Barney Bear and Baby Huey? It is not. I'm oh. sorry. It is actually... I, I would it be is, more excited It is, is that, based on okay. a comic strip uh, written by Jules Pfeiffer. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, written and I, by Jules I like Pfeiffer. Jules Pfeiffer. Um, so we got that going on. And also, uh, per popular demand, you have asked us to review the notorious virtual reality cyber thriller The Lawnmower Man. And we have paired mm. that up with... Uh, in many respects, the good version of the lawnmower man. And we're going to be talking about that later in the episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, so stick around. That's coming up soon. Uh, so let's get started. And it looks like the big release, uh, sort of wide release, financially successful movie of the weekend is Ocean's 8. Mm-hmm. So Whitney. Yes. Tell me about Ocean's 8. Ocean's 8 is the fourth film in the Ocean's remake series. Yeah, the fifth uh, overall, if you include the original with the Rat Pack, no, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy yeah, the, the original was just sort of the Rat Pack hanging around. Uh, it's Stevens, actually not as fun as you'd think it no, would be. It's, it's, it's really actually, kind of slow and boring. It's just, yeah, there, there's a lot of just hanging out and singing scenes. And if you yeah. want to hang out, if you want to get drunk and hang out with the Rat Pack, watch Ocean's Eleven. And who wouldn't? That uh, was enough of a draw. It's just, yeah, they're really coasting on how hmm. great the cast is in that movie. And uh, so Steven Soderbergh came around and, and made... It was 2001. He made uh, another film called Ocean's Eleven, which is also 
also set in Las Vegas. Also but, has a mostly all star cast, and, uh, and he turned made it into sort of a heist movie. And well, it, it was, was a heist movie. Uh, yeah, he turned Ocean's Eleven into a, a heist movie. But it was a heist movie. I they were so, pulling yeah, a guess, heist. It just didn't feel like it didn't a heist feel movie. like a heist movie. The, the Steven Soderbergh Ocean's Eleven is a quick, spry, mm. fast montagey, fun soundtrack, gorgeous cinematography, the, sexy spy movie. The, the word is breezy, and yeah. uh, and even at the time, uh, Sp- I said spy movie. Spy it's movie, a heist, heist movie, I, not a spy, spy movie. movie. How did they do that? There's no spies in that movie. Not, not that a one. I know of. Not even ex spies. They might be something. really good spies, and that's why we don't. Know. <laughs> that's why we don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, George, George Clooney plays Danny Ocean, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Elliot Gould, Carl Reiner, mm-hmm. Julia Roberts, Andy Garcia. Everybody's Bernie in Mac. it. Bernie Mac is in it. Uh, um, John Cheadle is in it. Yeah. Everybody's in it. Yeah, and, great uh, cast. Julia Roberts introducing Julia Roberts. Wasn't that cute? Was a cute little thing. Cute, cute little did. winky jokey there. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was Steven Soderbergh just sort of having fun with his famous friends, mm-hmm. and it became this kind of weird pop culture marker for a lot of people because it was it's really good yeah it was, it was, well it was, made movie. It was really well put together it, it's not it's not serious at all no and it's a blast to watch then it was a big enough hit that they made oceans 12 and oceans 13 with ever expanding casts and mm-hmm. neither of those is very good uh, oceans my, 13 is okay oceans 12 is kind of a stinker oceans, oceans 12 is they they kind of flew off the rails my thing with the oceans movies in is that they're heist movies but I think the first one feels like a heist movie, but the rest of them kind of feel like the modern equivalent of the original Ocean's Eleven, where you're just kind of screwing around. Yeah. Um, And that's the thing with the Ocean's movies, is that there's not really, like, stakes. There really isn't much in the way of a threat in most of of I think that was kind of the point. That was kind of the central joke of the first Ocean's Eleven. It's like, we're going to do this because we're good at it, and it's fun, and we think it'll be fun if we dress well and people watch us do it. And you know what? They're right. And you know what? And I'm actually fine with that. That's Mm -hmm. that's more of an observation than a critique. I don't Mm -hmm. think every heist movie could get away with that, but they really captured a really good tone. Breezy is the best Mm -hmm. way to put it. Um, And when you look back at the original Ocean's movie, the original Steven Soderbergh one anyway, um, it's a story story about a heist plan in which everything goes right. Yeah, nothing. Even goes. when you think it's going wrong. It turns out actually, they plan that yeah. out ahead of time. And as yeah. a result, it's really fun the first time you watch it, but the second time you watch it, you realize not a lot is actually happening. <laughs> they just make a plan, the plan goes well, and wow. then we're done. And that's not really how heist movies usually build suspense. And then the rest of the movies in the franchise were pretty much the same thing. Even Ocean's 8, it's, uh, the new it, film. There's a, It's just the before, same thing. It's the same thing. Ocean, uh, uh, Sandra Bullock stars Please. as Danny Ocean's it's sister, Deb, Debbie. Deb Ocean. Yeah. Uh, and her thing is... And, she oh, just, and, and, and uh, Danny Ocean is dead. Uh, yeah, she we find vi- that out right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. Danny yeah. Ocean has died and she visits his grave. And I love that the first thing she says when she visits his grave is, you'd better really be dead. <laughs> and you keep waiting the whole movie for him right. to come back to. Yeah. I won't tell you whether or not he does, but you keep waiting. Yeah. Um... Here's but here's the thing. So she has just left prison, mm-hmm. and she and has has, a, has a heist planned already. Yeah, she's been spending her entire time planning the perfect heist, and she's going to steal one of the one of, if not the world's most expensive diamond necklace at the Met Gala. And if you're not familiar with the Met Gala, it's one of the social occasions of the year throughout the entire world. Celebrities from all over converge and team Wear up the with most fashion expensive designers. Expensive outfits and yeah. designers get to show Go- off their new designs. Google it. It's, the yeah. costumes and pe- and outfits people wear are astounding and um there there have been documentaries all about it it's really cool actually um so he plans to steal the diamond necklace and he's to put together a team and then just before the heist actually goes off she's giving a speech to them Mm. and the speech basically includes a sentiment and listen prison ain't so bad yeah even if we get caught it's really it's not as bad as you think it is it's fine Mm. And that's the tone of this, because the Oceans movies aren't about heists, they're about cool people pulling off the mm. impossible. And, and that's the fantasy, and that's and, a good fantasy. And Sa- Sandra Bullock, uh, Kate Blanchett, with uh, her no- her coolness knob cranked up to, like, 15. Like, the first, like, 20 minutes or so of the movie after the prologue is just Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett, like eating at cafes and making mm. plans and that's enough the whole movie could have been that there's like just so much having... star power there's... just with those two and and uh, whoever costumed this movie is clearly having the time of their lives Oscar dressing these off, nominee off, please off, off all these like really awesome actresses mm-hmm. let's just put them in the best 
outfits we can possibly think. Uh, Mindy Kaling could knock over a truck in that dress she's wearing. <laughs> Um, there's a moment there's a at the end where, where they all get to dress up yeah, where real they get nice. To dress and up, like, yeah. mm. and this, there's I, a scene where Kate Blanchett is strolling down a New York street, like past a hot dog cart, wearing like a sequined like 70s stretch pantsuit with like flare bell bottom legs. And you realize like you, you expect her to start shooting lasers out of her hands. <laughs> Like, she just looks so friggin' awesome. It's interesting. I think, oh, so this movie is directed by Gary Ross. It's mm. not directed by Steven Soderbergh. And Gary Ross directed a lot of Oscar y claptrap, like Seabiscuit. Um, he, he's, 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 what, he's, he's an com- okay director, but I, I, I think he's completely um, serviceable. He's completely serviceable. Um, mm. He's probably best known as a director mm. for directing The Hunger Games, which the first one was not the best one. Yeah. Um, he's also well known for directing Pleasantville, a movie which has aged poorly. Mm. Uh, he also did Free State of Jones, which I got to talk to, I got to interview oh, yeah, him about, about Free State that. of Jones, and uh, I, I was like one of the only people who really dug Free State of Jones, because it feels like a history lesson. Everybody says, this is movie terrible, it feels like a history lesson. That's why I like it. I want to learn this stuff, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so he directs this, and he does not have that sharp, sexy sense of style well, that Steven Soderbergh does, but what he does, mm-hmm. and I think this is wise... He gives that style to the characters. He let he lets the characters dictate the pace of the movie. Yeah, which is death in a way, but is yeah kind of the wisest thing to do in this case mm-hmm. because we like the characters immediately. Each time we see them, it's like, oh, I love this character immediately. Mm-hmm. We see um, uh, Aquafina doing three three card Monty, and she's. We just we like her already. And yeah, she, she was the she one boosts, person boosts a watch. She uh, was the one member of the of the eight that right. I was unfamiliar with, really, as a performer. And she's great. She's like, great right yeah. off the bat. We got so we, she's great. Mindy Kaling's great. Helena Bonham Carter has her best role in a while. <laughs> she's <laughs> sort of a, a put upon, somewhat fallen fashion designer. Yeah, who she's gets, really gets funny. back in. Um, Anne Hathaway, however, it's kind of like it's almost her movie. Like if you're like pushing for like an Oscar nomination, you. Which her because she plays <laughs> she plays the uh, vapid version of herself. Yeah, it's, she's really playing like off her type, and mm. that's really gives her license to be amazing. Now it's Anne Hathaway, and she's usually amazing. I'm trying to think of an example of which she's not, <laughs> um, and I'm failing. Mm. Uh, I but did, I didn't see Havoc. I didn't see Havoc either. Mm. But uh, most people didn't. So <laughs> here's the thing, though. So she is a a big movie star. She's. They actually she, like. She plays a big movie. She doesn't play herself. I wish they kind of. That she had. Yeah, they it would already, be kind of a fun little like little mind blow. They yeah. play that in the Ocean's Twelve when actual Julia Roberts right, is a plot right, point, right. and it just so happens that the Julia Roberts character looks like her. They don't do that here. Uh, but she plays a version of herself that is really egomaniacal. There's even a line when she shows up and someone speaks into their earpiece. The ego has landed. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and she is she's she's vain she's insecure mm-hmm. she's easily manipulated because of that because, because of how vain she is yeah. yeah and as a result they're able to use her in order to get the diamonds out into the open and there's so, she, like, so she's technically one of the eight and she's having so much <laughs> fun she's having as much fun as Michelle Williams was in I feel pretty and just sort of mincing about in really nice gowns and you know unable to really think straight I love the moment where she sees the necklace and the necklace is huge Huge. Yeah, it's, it's basically it's six, ne- it's six pounds. You they could, say in the movie, you could beat the diamond from Titanic to death with this necklace. <laughs> like that's how big this diamond necklace is. And she puts it on, mm. and she's having like an herbal essences moment. <laughs> she's the like only pra- way to describe practically it. having an orgasm with yeah, this thing on her skin. Oh, it's great. So, but basically, when you look at it structurally, it's built a lot like the original Ocean's Eleven. Mm-hmm. It turns out it there is, is something they, kind of personal about they the assemble heist, the but, team. Each one has yeah. a, an area of expertise. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, of course, need a computer hacker. Everyone needs a computer hacker. It's mm-hmm. Rihanna in this case, who is also great, uh, reprising her role from Valerian. But what's uh, <laughs> I, like, I like to think she is. But what I really dug the most about this because it works on all those levels. It's a mm-hmm. fun heist movie. The characters are great. The cast is sparkling. Mm-hmm. Everything about it basically works. But what I really, really liked about it was that. This doesn't feel like it's just another piece of fluff. It has fluffy bits to it, mm-hmm. but the movie actually takes the opportunity when it can to use itself as a bit of commentary. There's a really great scene where they uh, run into there's, there's, one, there's one line in particular I would like to address. Absolutely, but, yeah. but I don't think it's this one. There's a bit where they go up to see Helena Bonham Carter, and they have to like con- she's not a thief; she's a fashion designer, so mm-hmm. they need to get her on board. And what they do is they commiserate over the lousy reviews of her latest fashion show, mm. and that whole scene. 
you can tell is a is a scene that all of those actors have played out after one of their movies got bad reviews. <laughs> they talk about the critics. <laughs> Helen Bonham Carter mistakes Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett for for journalists, and they both go. <gasps> Oh, oh goodness, no, no. journalists. Jeez. There's a, there's a lot of there's we're, a, we're thieves. Please give us some credit. They, but there's a lot of talk about the way that as women mm. they are being treated before the heist, during the heist. Sandra mm-hmm. Bullock has a great line about how well, uh, the, we want to be ignored. Yeah, this, this is the this, one this time is, in our life we want to be ignored because we can come in and out of here. That, we can take and advantage. That's, of that's that. the line I wanted to address. They're they're going through like a stack of potential. They haven't completed the whole team yet, and they're looking for. They essentially have eight by ten glossies of like hackers that they want to hire. Yeah, because th- I guess heisters have well, the, uh, but the it, network. But again, I think there's they're a, I think going there's through, a commentary theme here about the way entertainment is yeah, made. And yeah, I, but, it's subtle, but I like that it's there. Th- their their comment is yeah the what what you said. They're going through and it's like uh, how about this guy? It's like no no I don't want him. Why not? He, why not? He's a he. I want a she. I want she's. Like, well, what's wrong? This guy's really good. No, she's. She's can go in and out. She's are ignored. And for he, the first time in our lives, we want to be ignored. We, we want to be ignored. And it's yeah. like, oh, that's kind of kind of dark. But yeah, okay, stick it's, it to the man, dude. <laughs> and there's a great speech use, she has use at the that end. to our advantage. There's a great speech she has at the end where she says, somewhere out there is a young girl staring in bed, staring up at the ceiling, dreaming about being a criminal. <laughs> Let's do this for that girl. And you're sort of like, which is an, an inversion of the usual. It, inspirational speech it is but when you think about it on a certain meta level mm. what you're talking about is here is a heist movie mm. for all the for all the young women all the young girls out there who never got this kind of heroic criminal roles mm. on mass and now here are eight of them yeah in one movie and it's a really good movie in fact in many respects i think the first i think the first oceans 11 with frank sinatra and all that that's, mm. has a novelty factory that is only matched by the handful of other Rat Pack movies. I think Robin and his Seven Hoods is actually a better film. Yeah. But um, but it, it's a movie, it's only eh. Steven Soderbergh's first Ocean's Eleven is really fun, and I'm not going to mm. say a bad word about it. But Ocean's Eight is really fun, and there's something to it. There's actually mm. like a reason for it to exist other than we're having fun, and I think it plays off of it in very good thoughtful ways that never get in the way of the entertainment value. Mm. They just work together in a good bit of synergy, mm. and I really dug it. Okay. <laughs> I just really dug I was just a big, I, big fan of this. I, I think it's, it, I think it is a, a little too sort of uh, featherweight for its own good. It's, it's like, oh, and they pull off the heist and that's it. And you're, you know, in and out in 97 minutes. And yeah. It's like, uh, no spoilers uh, here. They, guess what? The heist is goes okay. Uh, every, like it, they don't it, all die in a bloodbath. They don't die in a bloodbath. Yeah. This is an Ocean's film. Characters don't really die in bloodbaths in Ocean's films. Uh, there are some surprises. There are some twists. There are mm-hmm. some turns. We're not going to ruin those. Some you might be able to predict. Some you won't. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, it's just, I feel like it is, they are just sort of aiming for featherweight entertainment, which is fine. And I think it's great. I think I want to compare it to something like Love, Simon. Where okay, I still uh, haven't seen that. Uh, it, it's it's revolutionary in in its banality. Strangely enough, mm-hmm. Love Simon is kind of a bland teen romance. The main character is really really boring. But we haven't had a, a mainstream studio funded teen romance with a gay character before, and that we had one that just worked on every level and was just sort of average is kind of revolutionary unto itself. Yeah, it doesn't need to make so, a point of it. Yeah, it doesn't need to be yeah. a, a capital G great movie to be kind of a, a turning point. And I, I, and I agree. And I think the fact that they were able mm-hmm. to make this very entertaining summer mm-hmm. crime comedy thriller with, again, an all-star cast. Um, and, and that in and of itself is part of the insidiousness. And I think that the movie is just thoughtful enough to comment on that when it needs to. Okay. And I wanted to highlight those moments because I don't want them to be missed because mm. I think that's the movie revealing itself. There's mm. a line and I can never remember who said it and I don't think I'm saying it right. right. So I have trouble looking it up. But I want to say it was Truffaut who said this. Mm. Um, directors need... if. If you're going to spin your camera around 360 degrees three times, you have to spin it back five degrees once just so the audience knows you did it on purpose. <laughs> Every once in a while, you need to just poke your head out and just say, we know. We were th- we're doing this on purpose. I know. You're kind of dizzy. And I think that's what Ocean's 8 does well. It does mm-hmm. all the fun stuff. It gives you that little that little twisteroo, but every once in a while it pokes up and says, 
we know. Mm -hmm. We know this is a big deal. We're going to have fun with it. But every once in a while, we're just going to let you know, we know it's a big deal and we are thinking about Mm -hmm. it. And I think that that just puts it over the edge. And in many respects, it is my favorite Oceans movie. Okay. So, um, yeah. And I'm not the hugest fan of the others, as you might have noticed. I speak Mm -hmm. with them with... Nice, Cut. but not Cut. particularly Cut. reverent tones. Mm. But uh, yeah, this one is this one is great, and I hope everyone checks it out. Mm. Uh, let's talk about uh, Hereditary. Hereditary. Hereditary is maybe one of the best films of the year. Um, I really dug Hereditary. I know you did. <laughs> Hereditary is about a family who is suffering. Mm. There is a lot of unspoken angst in their house. Everybody is really sort of mad and disturbed. And, uh, We're going to be really coy with the plot on this one yeah, because there's not a um, lot of it. But what happens? There's is, not a lot of it, and there's there are intense. there are some intense and there are some like surprises that I wouldn't dream of revealing. But uh, yeah, Tony Collette plays sort of the matriarch. She's an artist, and she's working her way through uh, just a lot of issues that she had uh, well, s- connected to her mom. Well, I'll, I think I can do this pretty pretty right. well. Okay, so it's it's about a family. Tony Collette plays the mom. Gabriel Byrne plays the father. Mm. Alex Wolf mm. uh, is the teenage son, and I forget mm. the name of the young girl who plays Charlie, mm. their youngest daughter. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of the movie, Tony Collette's mother has died, and yeah. we find out that Tony Collette's mother was really a traumatic person to be around. Tony yeah. Collette is still dealing with a lot of baggage, and in mm. fact, now that her she's n- dead, is Millie Shapiro. Thank you. She's yeah. a really good actor. Um, the the young girl. Yeah. Uh, She's she was such a traumatic influence, particularly on Tony Collette, mm. and the rest of the family was estranged from her because Tony Collette didn't want them to see her. Uh, that when she died, everyone just sort of just like, yeah, okay, yeah. Like and, there's and, not a lot of mourning. Well, and like, we, we hear a, the eulogy right away, and about the eulogy was like the, mo- the most like hurtful, deeply ambivalent thing in the world. It's like my mom's dead, and she was really kind of horrible. And I don't want to say I'm relieved because I'm not because I feel horrible about the horrible things she did, but yeah. she was horrible. Um, this is at her funeral. Yeah, I mean, she's more subtle um, about it, but it's all in there. Yeah. It's all subtext. And, and what sure. happens is we find out that the mom was also uh, mentally ill mm. and that this is something that... And, they've been, and they had been looking after her in their home yeah. for the last uh, period of her life. And we start seeing signs over the course of the first part of the film and then onward mm. that that level of it's called hereditary for a reason mm. that that may have carried over to the family. But... Then something else happens, something yeah. horrible happens, and then the family is really torn to yeah, shreds, there's, there's and a, then maybe the supernatural starts peeking in as well. Yeah, the, they, the, the guilt and the unspoken emotions between the characters is just compounded by a, a really shocking event in their lives, and yeah, the, the, the unspoken, the period of the movie where the unspoken guilt becomes more and more intense and Tony Collette becomes more and more unhinged as her family begins to sort of dissolve around her is it's, it's like this weird Chekhovian parlor drama. It's an, it is an acting tour de force mm. this for is, Tony Collette in particular, but I also want to give a shout out. Uh, Gabriel Byrne actually has, it's a tough role, but it's kind of like a boring role because he's like the voice of sanity in the family. And I mm. want to talk about that because that's actually has something to do with the critique I have. Mm. But uh, for her and Alex Wolf, as they both mentally deteriorate, mm. he they're, matches. They're, they're the two that really, kind of take it the most, but yeah. Uh, Tony Collette has been like kind of low key, not really appreciated. Mm. One of the best actors we've had for a really long time. Yeah. And when she gets a yeah. juicy she, she, role, she is a treasure. To when Nicolette. she gets a juicy role, mm. she is incredible. And this mm. is a masterful performance from her. She is transformative in this mm. movie. And Alex Wolf matches her, and he is a young actor, and that is hard to do. Mm. He is so much depth in his performance matching her that well, at, credit is due. At, at the beginning of the movie, he seems like just boring teenage son. Yeah. And as as the movie goes on, and and, and he like starts to like, we realize that he's kind of getting hit the hardest by what's going on in this house Mm -hmm. with with the whole family. That yeah, we get to see not just vulnerability, just 
complete weakness. We see him completely collapse. And that's something you don't see a lot of in uh, movies. Especially not in young men. Yeah, like all young very male, true. Yeah, young male roles. Typically, they're the ones who have to sort of stand up, or there's a lot of machismo involved, and not with this guy. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes, just yeah. period, for acting or whatever in movies in the last few years was in a movie called Force Majeure, mm-hmm. which is a really great movie, and it kind of flew under oh, the uh, radar for a lot of people. The scene where he breaks down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, okay, I'm not going to ruin Force Majeure for you. It's kind of a slight drama and a lot of way it's not like a super intense story nothing like that but there's a scene where the one of the protagonists of this movie ugly cries the ugliest ugly cry <laughs> you've ever seen in a movie and it's perfect mm. it's such a great it's moment exactly it's a great what role. that moment i really love that movie hereditary is really especially fantastic mm. when you're focused on Sort of the nightmare realism of it, where we're looking at it from here's a perspective. Here's a story that is ignore the supernatural elements. Like let's assume for a moment mm. that that's in their head, which a movie plays coy with a lot. Mm. Uh, the, there, it, there are some things that like it, it looks like there's certainly a ghost in the corner, or there's mm. something like a shadow passes but by. There's, but there's always like some pl- plausible deniability there. So yeah, you're not yeah. really sure how supernatural this is for a long time. And that's when it's at its best. Yeah. When it's at that sort of Twin Peaks fire walk with me kind of way, where yeah. all of this stuff is sort of dreamlike, mm. and you can take it and as are, literally as you want. To. And there are dreams. Oh yeah, some really horribly disturbing dreams. You can take it as literally as you want to, mm. and that means that you can either say the supernatural is real, or if you really want to wrap your head around it, you can say that this is all in the heads from the perspective of people who have a his- family history of mental illness, mm. and this is them losing their minds, and that in and of itself is really really terrifying for me. My biggest critique mm. is, I think, the movie's finale, which I will not ruin in any mm. way. They they de- they define too much. They give away yeah. too much. Yeah, they, it's they, a they hell make it, of an ending, but my God, they really spelled it out well, more than I needed it to. It's it's reminiscent of a film that I can't reference, otherwise I would give give away what the ending was. But it's reminiscent of of films you may have seen before. Oh, oh, here, here's an example that's more extreme. Uh-huh. Psycho. Okay. The original Psycho. Mm-hmm. There's that big twist ending yeah. where we... And listen, Psycho is a 50-plus-year-old movie. You should know Psycho. Mm. So we're going to spoil Psycho for you. Psycho. Norman Bates... Norman Bates' mother is dead. Mm. Norman Bates has been dressing as his mother and killing people. Mm. Then the end of Psycho, after that moment, it's about like a 10-minute sequence mm. of just explaining that. Yeah, where the, the shrink just prattles on and on and on about what we've already figured out. And that's justified for when it was made, when a lot of the... Co- Ideas involved in that scene were not common knowledge, not just to, mo- to movie going audiences, to movie going yeah. audiences. Not even within the horror genre was that something that was commonly talked about. So it makes sense. But you watch it today, and that last scene is just paced like death. Mm. And here, it's not that extreme, but it's just like you know what? Cut ninety percent of the dialogue. They made explicit something that was stronger being implicit, yeah. and. I don't mind the way it played because there's a lot of wonderful imagery in there. Uh, in in the like that last ten or fifteen minutes, mm-hmm. and you know when just things kind of explode into madness, and yeah, by by then I was just so knotted up in the anxiety and the fear of this movie that it was kind of a, just a relief to have that. Yeah, to, to the, it, kind of a weird thing to say that there it was a relief to be terrified by all of these extreme images, but. It, I think it fits. I think it works fine. Uh, it is explicit. It does overplay its hand. It doesn't need to be quite as overt when its power was power light and being subtle. But mm. uh, it it still works fine. And I, was, I still think I was, it works. I wasn't disenchanted by. No, the I have end. I have that critique, and I have another critique, and I have to give credit uh, to my wife Michelle who. Mm. Uh, saw the movie on a separate date. I, mm. I had to see it for work. She couldn't go. She went to see it another day. Mm. And when she came back, she had the similar concern about the ending. But one of the things that really ticked her off was, and she still thought the movie was well made, mm. but the 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 Gabriel Byrne character, uh-huh. she thought was indicative of a, of a serious problem that the movie has, which is mostly an attitude. And that's its attitude towards women is very paranoid mm-hmm. and it's almost accusatory. All of the yeah. horror 
comes from women. Comes all from, of the, yeah, all the female characters are yeah. the ones wielding. Yeah, and even they, and Alex Wolf is also arguably suffering from mental illness, but he gets it from his mom and his grandmother and, and, Gabriel, a, and a sister too. Yeah, Gabriel Byrne is the yeah. only voice of reason here. Oh, we have the stalwart male mm. who's going to be the only voice of reason, and it she it she found it. I'm gonna I'm, I'm paraphrasing her, but. Mm. Uh, kind of uh, condescending. A little condescending, and it's frustrating because the rest of the movie is made with such class and skill mm-hmm. that to fall back on such a kind of a tired attitude mm-hmm. about characters in a horror movie, she thought was really disappointing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a fair critique. I still think it's a really great movie, and I still think um, just the yeah, look, experience of watching it in a theater with a good sound system mm-hmm. is almost unsurpassable. Like, it's so great. You, you definitely but I think it's fair made, to critique it as well. Uh, this is getting uh, slammed uh, by audiences. It got a really low cinema score, which is a good sign, I think. I think, uh, <laughs> like, the... I forgot which movies got Fs, but I, I remember Mother. one of them was Mother. Yeah, and Mother is friggin' great, well, and and it. it's a friggin' nightmare, and it'll rip your throat out and stomp on your throat. A twenty four has this thing where they are really good at finding horror movies that really hardcore horror fans, like truly hardcore horror fans, mm. key into, and that film critics love, and that they are really good at selling to mainstream audiences and building buzz for. But then once the mainstream audience actually goes to see The Witch. Mm. They don't know what to make of it because it's it's kind of obtuse. They're, Same thing with It Comes at Night, which I a actually lot of, wasn't a fan yeah, of. But a lot but, of these are are slow. These are horror movies that deal with uh, sort of the philosophy of horror. They're really slow moving. They're incredibly thoughtful. They're more about atmosphere than they are about like scares. And I think when audiences hear, oh, this is the scariest movie of all time, mm-hmm. they're expecting something wham bang like Insidious or, yeah. or the or you know, the other adjective horror movies, um, <laughs> sinister. Etc. The movie I think of and, actually, in a, in a way, and I think it's a better movie than than Hereditary. Even hmm. Hereditary is really good. But the way The Exorcist got built up to me when I was young, it's the scariest oh, yeah, movie yeah. ever. And then I saw it when I was a teenager, and um, I liked it. And you're expecting like more violence yeah. and, and a lot more mayhem. In it's a movie, a movie like that is scarier the older you get because you're you're what you expect. Because mm. the way the uh, uh, they both this and Hereditary work, mm. Nexus and Hereditary work is. The world is real. You take the characters serious. Mm. And as the horror starts building up on it, it feels more unnatural and more disturbing. Mm. Whereas many films like... Like, Insidious begins with, like, the loudest string section I've ever heard in a movie. It announces (laughs) itself. And that's a different kind Mm. of horror. It's a valid kind of horror, but it's Mm. a different kind of horror. It's also not what Insidious means, as the director pointed out to us. (laughs) In- insidious is like kind of kind of sneaky and, and you know insinuating itself unknowingly into your midst, not like seven hundred violins at once. Funnily enough, you could replace the names. You could call Hereditary Insidious and Insidious Hereditary, and they would both make sense. Yeah, well, Hereditary is kind of a, a vague title. Yeah, as long as something's uh, passed on, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. You, you could probably call this movie just about anything. You know, Un- Uncle Nutsy's Fun Bubblegum Circus. It would still be a terrifying movie. We would talk about that title, though. I think we would. <laughs> I think that would be a topic of conversation. <laughs> I would dig the heck out of a movie called Uncle Nutsy's Fun Bubblegum, but what did I... I, I don't even I fucking remember, man. <laughs> Moving on. Hotel Artemis is a new film. <laughs> Different film. Hotel Artemis is a new... Is, film. That is, it's a new film. What did you think? <laughs> Quite new. Okay, moving uh, on. Uh, Drew Pierce wrote and directed this film. Drew Pierce uh, co-wrote Iron Man 3, and it's got a very similar vibe. That kind Which, of uh, like fun, arch, jokey thriller vibe. I think it's very retro. I, th- I, I smelled Stuart Gordon all over this I movie. See that. Stuff like four, but when he was in sort of his mid to high-ish budget uh, is it, era, stuff like is, Fortress and Robot Jocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's very genre, but in a very almost hokey way. But I think that's, but, that's part of its charm. But that's why it's so great. You like it a little bit more than I, I do. I love it. Okay, so I ho- love Hotel Artemis so damn much. I, I, I'm not surprised. Okay. Hotel Artemis <laughs> Uh, it takes place in the near future. I think it's like 2028. It's 10 years in the future. Uh, and uh, in the midst of a Los Angeles riot over water, which ends up not being important. <laughs> that, it's that's just, just a reason about, why people... Just, there's, there's a riot that's been raging for who knows how long the city is being destroyed. It's just a reason that's why, just the backdrop. It's just a reason why people can't leave the building. Mm-hmm. And the building is an old hotel mm-hmm. in downtown Los Angeles, it looks like. Uh, and the top floors are a hospital for criminals. And Mm. much in the same way that the Continental Hotel was a hotel for criminals in John Wick, here it's a super hospital for sort of arch 
super characterized mm-hmm. criminals, and it's run by Jodie Foster in her first movie role in like five years, her first leading movie role, yeah, in a long, long, long. She, time. She's had plenty of supporting roles along the way, but yeah, not in the last five years. The last big movie role she had was Elysium. Oh yeah, I guess so. She did a couple like TV little yeah. guest bits, but like this is like a big role, big return it, for her. It, and it, which is kind of now she plays the heck out of this role. It's she, a good role. She for creates her. a character from the ground up. She uh, she is the the mistress of this hotel. She's also agoraphobic, so she has she doesn't leave. Yeah, uh, very much like Sigourney Weaver's character in Copycat. Underrated uh, movie, I think. Un- I like Copycat. Copycat's a good flick. <laughs> Harry Connick Jr. is freaking terrifying in that movie. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, she, she doesn't want to go out. She's always in her nurse's outfit, and she's just sort of a put-upon employee who knows the rules and mm-hmm. will always abide by them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, we start – there's an opening heist sequence that the movie actually really didn't need. You could have cut that out. <laughs> uh, it just sort of gives us a little backstory on the main character. Uh, these two guys hold up a bank. They steal a bunch of stuff from the people in the bank, not the vault, and uh, they get shot on the way out. Uh, one of the characters needs to be taken to Hotel Artemis. They have a membership there, luckily. Yeah. And yeah, they go up and they have, they, they, they like clone livers and use these special uh, gigantic robots to make sure he's okay. And we get to know the characters all go, who all go by like clue type code names. Well, they're every, who, live in, who are every, in the hotel at that moment. Every suite in the hotel has been turned into like, you know, they're an exotic med-day. locale. Yeah. And like they're all named every exotic locales. So, like one of them is named Acapulco. Another mm-hmm. one's named Waikiki. So we have Sterling K. Brown, mm-hmm. great actor. Uh, he plays the bank robber who wasn't shot, but who mm-hmm. took his brother there. Uh, we have Charlie Day, who is like a gun runner. Who's really and, very Charlie Day. I think Charlie Day found his calling. I've seen him mm-hmm. in a lot of comedies where he plays kind of like a wimpy guy who's you know threatened a lot yeah and he gets really shrill really fast in those kinds of roles Mm. here he plays essentially the steve buscemi type role like kind of a weaselly jerk yeah i buy him as a steve buscemi type he's better here than he is in comedies and we also have uh sophia butella Mm. who plays uh an assassin it's a bit uh, on the nose for sophia butella (laughs) she needs a better role he's mostly playing superficial stuff she's good at it but she needs better stuff. And, and she's good in this, and the stunt, yeah. she, the stunts she does and the fighting she does is really impressive. I, I buy yeah. her. I just want her to get a better role. And then there's Dave Batista, who is uh, Jodie Foster's like nurse. His orderly, yeah. It, he's uh, the orderly. And he's really, really fun. And uh, then it turns out that like the biggest criminal in town mm. is en route. They call him, what is it, the Wolf Prince or the Wolf King? The Wolf King, 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 of, the Wolf Los King of Los Angeles. Yeah. We, we don't see him, but he's coming. Eventually we see like, him. But like, eventually yeah. we see him. But yeah, we, we get a call from Zachary Quinto saying, my dad is hurt and we're coming. We're a half hour out. He's like, well, you can't make a reservation. If somebody comes, I serve them. Nope. He owns the hotel. <laughs> okay. So things are ratcheting up. There's a there's a word and everything builds just so wonderfully in that B movie mayhem sort of way where you just know things are going to go bad for everybody. Yeah. And you're waiting for those moments to happen and you're not necessarily shocked when they happen or surprised in the way they happen, but you're just in admiration of how well they happen. Well, there's a word, uh, I, I guess it's a hyphenate, but uh, that I thought of a lot when I was watching Hotel Artemis and that's world building. Uh, yeah. And what and what Drew Pierce I think has right. done with Hotel Artemis is he's created yeah, world building, but he yeah, has yeah. he's created he doesn't just have characters in a location. You didn't have to build a world for that. He built a world in which these arch characters can live, mm. and which he has figured out all the details. And by God, he will show you his work. <laughs> like every detail There's, is on screen, and I don't think we needed a lot of it, mm. but I like that he did the work. Mm. My problem with this movie. And the reason why I don't love it. I like it a lot. You you can't have any problems with Hotel Artemis. It's the perfect (laughs) B-movie. No, I like it a lot. And I'm recommending people check it out. But I think the thing that's keeping this movie from being truly great for me is that he's come up with this ultra-detailed world. And with the exception of the Jodie Foster character... Mm. Everybody's the characters, a the, everybody is a cartoon, and I think that and Sterling came Brown, he's, Sterling he's Brown, a human he, guy. He at, I think that's him as an actor adding gravitas where there isn't a lot. Oh, okay, everyone has like one plot point, and this whole mm. anonymity angle only hurts that. Mm. I think it only makes it that much harder for them to bring more out of their characters, mm. and I think part of that is the fun that mm. here's a bunch of cartoon characters, uh, sort of in this situation. But I think if with a little bit more emphasis on who mm. they are and how they actually like what they actually mm. give a shit about as opposed to their like, task in the plot. Mm. I think this really could have been really special. 
I've seen a lot of B movies that go far, way too far with that sort of cartoony style you're referring to. We once reviewed a film on the on the B movies podcast called Boon Raku. If you remember oh, yeah. that one at all, really uh, super stylish. I, I super love the style. Do, of yeah, it. the style was really great. And yeah. there's some shots like, that I remember, but I don't remember any of the characters imagine, or the plot points. Imagine an action movie told in the style of Japanese puppet theater. Yeah, that's uh, but with it's, live actors. It's a it's, great style. Not much of a story. Not, I couldn't not, tell you the plot for if you put a gun to my yeah, head. Nothing else going on yeah. in a movie called Boon Raku and. You can tell when a filmmaker is really just trying to roll around in their cinematic toys and not tell a story. Mm-hmm. And if you do it well enough, that's fine. If you you're just going, if you're going nuts with your style and you, you create something kind of new and intriguing, that's that's a, an accomplishment unto itself. I think Hotel Artemis finds the exact right balance where we can have a cartoony future world with, you know, liver cloning machines, but all of the characters are still human enough that we can get involved in the drama. Um, which is why I compare it to Stuart Gordon. That's a, a balance he was always able to strike really, really well. Hmm. He was able to create these sort of outlandish scenarios, but give us characters that are that feel like they're humans. I don't think that this is far too stylish. I think it's just stylish enough. For me, the movie I think of in terms of getting it's okay in terms of getting the um, that tone right. I think of the original John Wick. I think that's a modern action classic. I really do. I love John Wick. And the thing the, with John, the first John Wick. The first John Wick. The second one has the same problems that I'm accusing or Hotel Artemis of having. <laughs> it just goes it gets well, weird it, and distancing. When it, when it's, and, the action's cool, but like when the story it's, of the when it's revealed that every, every single human in New York is a secret assassin, yeah. it gets a little bit. Yeah, see what I mean? Like it gets to the characters get too cartoonish, and then even John Wick's motivation mm. is really kind of abstract and I don't give a shit. With John Wick 1, the motivation was really human. And mm. it wasn't just like my brother got shot in a bank robbery. Mm. Okay. Oh. But I'm not really <laughs> emotional. Like that, that's not something I'm really going to connect to. Um, when it comes to John Wick, his wife died. The dog she got him gets killed. Mm. That's so emotionally like intense. Everyone can relate to that. That everything feels kind of justified, and even the arch characters, like the the really almost cartoonishly evil guy who kills the dog in the first place, mm. we find out that he's like that because he's a shitty person. <laughs> Not because that the world is full of cartoon people, mm. it's because he acts like that because he's shitty. And everyone around him actually has behavior that resembles some humanity. In an arch world, mm. there's some humanity. Here, in an arch world, there are arch characters for me, and mm. I never, with the exception of Jodie Foster, I think is a really say, good performance. Jo- Jodie Foster is the rock, though. She kind of brings them all together. She's Jodie Foster yeah, is. Uh. I agree. She's fantastic. <laughs> I love just the way she walks. So much thought went into mm. this the determined she- short steps that she makes. Are so yeah. tell you volumes about her character. Like, I, I I take my job seriously. I'm very controlled all the time. Mm-hmm. It's such a great, really great detail. Um, but yeah, no, just the majority of the cast, I could take them or leave them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still had a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to take. I don't want to focus entirely on my mm-hmm. one critique. All right. I still think it's a really entertaining movie, and it's got this 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 almost canon group cheese value yeah. to it that yeah. we don't have a lot, and I think it's done with some intelligence. I dig it. Yeah, I, and I think I f- it's worth seeing. I feel like we don't get a lot of screenplays like this anymore. No. Like, if, if somebody comes we, at you with like a high concept like this, it's either given the one million dollar Blumhouse treatment, mm-hmm. which is fine, this or, didn't or it's cost give, that much, or it's given the the two hundred and fifty million dollar like super blockbuster treatment, and they add like extra. It's like a six act movie all of a sudden. Yeah. And apart from that opening heist sequence, this has no fat. It's really trim. It comes up with a great idea. It f- narrows in on it and gives us everything we need to know about that world really efficiently, really quickly, and lets the story go from there, rather than constantly coming up with rules or talking about but how I, the rules play into the world. I think we this, understand everything from the beginning, and the story can just be told. But the story is... I'm sorry, I don't think the story is particularly great, and I think the story is ultimately about mm. those rules. Yeah. Like, it's all about how the Artemis got founded, and mm. what happened, why Jodie Foster is in there, and I feel like it's not the backdrop. The Hotel Artemis... Mm is the point. And I think when you build a world and you're only really interested in exploring the world and the characters in it are kind of just an mm. excuse to do so, the movie feels a little shallower than it needs to. I'm mm. not saying I want it to be like 
full of rich soulful monologues i hate it when like you critique something and then like someone's just like well, what do you want to be citizen kane no but that's not the only option <laughs> there's a lot of i want it to be a, i want it to be a better version of this yeah, that's I what just, i'm talking about i think about. it could have been i think it was really close okay. to being something that i would have fallen in love with as much as you did mm. but it's still a lot of fun and okay. i hope it doesn't get overlooked because this is the kind of movie i think people wish they made more of and then yeah. don't go see yeah, yeah. All, more often than not. The, the, this kind of mid-budget genre film from a studio is exactly yeah. what what we need hundreds more of. That's This is what we need everything to be in between the tent poles. Yeah. You know, every, everything, it seems like everybody's trying to be the tent poles now. It's like, the tent's up. We, it's good. We're good. <laughs> it's standing. <laughs> we don't need more poles in here. Just give us good stuff to put in there. Yeah. Um, oh, and the last new movie we're going to be reviewing is mm-hmm. Bernard and Huey, uh, and this is based on a comic trip by Jules Pfeiffer, mm-hmm. which I read a little of, but I wasn't like, I think it was in the Village Voice, and I didn't read the Village Voice very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is about two narcissists who are womanizing in New York. <laughs> uh, one of them is played by Jim Rash from Community, who I've never seen in a lead role before, and he's really, really mm-hmm. good in a lead role. Uh, the other one is played by David Koechner. Uh, oh, no, I like David Yeah, Heckner, Very yeah. funny actor, you know, from the Anchorman movies and a whole bunch of other broad comedies besides. Um, they were high, uh, they were, sorry, they were college friends mm-hmm. when David Keckner's character was young and handsome and basically had like the thickest mm-hmm. little black book anyone ever saw. <laughs> and he was constantly trying to hook his friend Bernard up with various ladies, but Bernard was a whiny neurotic. Now, 25 years later they're Mm -hmm. in their late 40s and the tide has actually turned Uh, Bernard is he's just an editor of like historical nonfiction, so it's not actually a great job Mm -hmm. but he's confident he's sexually voracious um, he's he's doing okay Uh Huey is rich he actually has I think he has like a greeting card company but he's estranged from his wife, he's estranged from his daughter, he's not confident or happy anymore. And Huey literally just pops up on Bernard's doorstep, waving like a big wad of cash around, and just basically moves himself in. Mm. And gradually, as time goes on, they find that those positions that have reversed are reverting back to the way they were in college. Okay. And Bernard starts becoming whinier and more neurotic again, and Huey becomes less neurotic and more egotistical narcissist. Uh, Bernard starts dating Huey's young daughter, played by Mae Whitman. She's like 25, yeah. but like too young yeah, for him. Too young for him, yeah. Um, and she starts treating him the way Bernard did in college. Yeah. Uh, and Huey starts dating, or, or starts sleeping with, amongst many other people, Bernard's ex, who he broke up with to be with Huey's daughter. Yeah. And that's kind of it. It's about a bunch of narcissists who do shit to feed their ego and feel bad when they don't. There's a line Bernard has, which is... Uh, oh, God, what was it? It's, uh, I'm damn it, I'm not... Sh- I'm not strong enough to be as shallow at 49 as I was at 24. <laughs> that's, that's a line. There's a lot of like really... It, it feels really modern, doesn't it? It does, and yet it was a 30-year-old screenplay that Jules Pfeiffer thought he'd lost. Yeah. And then they just basically updated little bits of it Jules, so it could play today. Jules Pfeiffer, who's still alive, by the way. Oh, yeah. I think he's in the late 80s, but yeah he's, yeah, he's still operating. It feels... Honestly, it, it feels like a relic of the 80s for me. And mm. this sort of... Uh, that sort of idea, that sort of independent New York spirit, that Woody Allen, mm. Witt Stillman, just ultra-smart people who don't know a goddamn thing in New York, mm. sleeping around but complaining that they're not sleeping around the way they want to. <laughs> and I find that very alienating here. I mm. think there are lots of good examples of it. You ever see Metropolitan? That's a great example. Mm. With Stillman in general, I think, is the master of this. But, <laughs> uh, you know, there are ways to make these people who should be off-putting mm. really relatable in some way. And here... No, I feel like we never really lift enough of the veil. Hmm. I feel like we just sort of see that we see we know who they are at the beginning, and although their power dynamic shifts slightly, it's just shifting to a spot we already saw before, and no one really evolves. Hmm. No one really comes out at the end, and you could say maybe it's all about this sort of endless loop of confidence and lack of confidence and the male ego and the way men are kind of trapped in that sort of mentality Mm. but you can also say that that's kind of trite 
And I don't it think is... the movie really gives you the intelligence that it's a very witty dialogue seems to think is there. It just is doesn't it amount a, to much. Is it a condemnation of that sort of behavior? Not really. Is it a satire of I that think, kind of behavior? I don't think it's a satire. I think there's a little bit of commentary. I think they know that Bernard and Huey are kind of shitty, but I also think we know that from the beginning. Hmm. Well, I you, just you feel like at the end of the movie, we don't feel like we've been anywhere. Okay. Just like we visited them and like we overstayed our welcome. You know, like when you visit family <laughs> and you visit family for like five days mm. and by the fifth day, you're just like, this should have been a three day trip. <laughs> you know, like it's just sort of, like, we, don't, we don't know what to do today. I, 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 I th- yeah, we're we're done. We don't have that much in common. Like, I just feel like that's Bernard and Huey. I mm-hmm. feel like it works better, probably as a strip, than it does mm-hmm. with just sitting mm-hmm. with these people. I've I've not read the strip that this is based on, but I'm familiar with Jules, Jules Pfeiffer's work, and he's always been uh, incredibly wry and really satirical and really cynical about a lot of uh, things that go on in American politics and American social life. And if he's writing a screenplay in the 1980s, you know, he was writing condemnations of Ronald Reagan and the culture that was going on in the 1980s. We're living through, like, the loudest amplified echo of Reaganomics right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the current president would not have been possible were it not for the policies of Reagan. Um you know the whole the you know the yuppie god thing. Mm-hmm. That, I feel that, like there's a and there's, there's a there's a contempt- satire in that in something like American Psycho. Yeah, but that's that there was a lot of coming down on that sort of culture in the 1980s. So I think if you're plucking a screenplay from the past and you're taking it out of that era and putting it in the present, I think it's going to have some sort of natural political connection. I actually wish they had left it in the 80s. I feel like the context would have given it a bit more of an oomph. Mm. A bit more of a, oh, look at that. And then we could say to ourselves, oh, but we're still doing that now. Mm. But making it now, you're just kind of saying that we haven't evolved at all. And maybe we haven't. Maybe that's true. I mean, granted, the movie never tells you Jules Fiverr lost this screenplay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't expect you to know that. Um, But, yeah, once you're actually just watching it, I just feel like we live in... There were movies and TV shows and certainly a lot of writers who were critiquing the social values of the 80s. Mm. most obvious example we could point to is Oliver Stone's Wall Street. Yeah. Um, but he was not alone. And yet I feel like there is a louder daily, largely thanks to social media, mm. critique of that social uh, uh, perspective mm. today. That not really having that in Bernard and Huey in any sort of meaningful way... Mm. Um, makes it feel more retro than it should. Huh. It just feels like, and this is the way it is, right? And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I don't. I don't really dislike it, but I also wouldn't really recommend it to anyone. Maybe if you just, if you're a fan of Jules Pfeiffer, if you like really witty dialogue, if you really find the idea of dissecting these sorts of male ego competitive relationships, there might be something there. But I've just seen better versions of it, hmm. um, so I'm not a big fan. Okay, I, I don't hate it. It's not, like, not going to make my worst of the year or nothing, but it didn't do anything for me. That's it's a shame. shame. I'm so sorry. So it's a C minus, but it's like not like a mm. damning C minus. Right. I just don't think it works. Although Jim Rash and David Koechner are really good in it, in particular. Mm. Um, okay, so uh, Hotel Artemis, uh, C plus. Yes. My goodness, this is a good movie. I'm giving you a C+. It is so two. much fun. I'm giving you a C plus two. Uh, mm. Not as passionate as yours, mm-hmm. but it's still really fun, and I think people should see it. Okay. Uh, I'm, and remember our scale is C minus to C plus. <laughs> so if you're new, we're not being assholes. C minus is the lowest we give. C plus is the mm. highest. Uh, let's C, see. C for critically acclaimed. Uh, hereditary. Saying. Hereditary C plus. I very really, much really, so. really dug Hereditary. It is terrifying. It will leave you very rattled, mm-hmm. and it has some really, really horrific. Nightmare imagery that will remind you of dreams you've had. I think it's fair to critique it. I think it's uh, sometimes mm. we have this sort of thing where when a movie comes along and wows so many people at once, there becomes a sort of, oh, am I going to be the it, asshole who says there are problems? Well, it's it's the critic's inst- instinct to say, whoa, there, Hoss, on just anything. It's mm. like, this is terrible. Whoa, there, Hoss. What's yeah. good about it? But the experience of watching it and the amount of dread it can mm. fill you with moment to moment is palpable mm. and yeah. it's really great. And, and Tony Collette gives one of the performances of her career. She should, by all rights, be an Oscar frontrunner. Mm-hmm. Just now. It's just one of those we, roles we, where it's we, like, she's so good. We'll see. I hope so. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, and uh, and finally, Ocean's 8. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, really dug it. Like, I all was right. surprised. I was looking forward to it. It seemed like a good cast and a fun idea. But I liked it even more than I thought I would. I think it's a really entertaining film with, bless it, some actual stuff on its mind. So good for them. Mm-hmm. I think it's the best Ocean's movie. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. I you, give it a high C. Just a high C. High C. Okay. 
even the first, even well, the first, even Steven Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven, well regarded. You mm-hmm. should see that one. Slick, tight. I wouldn't call it a cinema classic or nothing. Oh God, no! It's just, it's just, it's just a <laughs> that, good, that's fun also, movie. That's also a high C. You okay. know, that, that's the kind of movie they were aiming to make, and they I would, did it very well. And I, I would think, give that one a C plus as well. I think they're right. both worth seeing. Okay, uh, but I think Ocean's Eight just got a little more meat on the bones. So it's mm. just, it's a, it's a good film. Uh, so that is it for the new releases, mm. and now. Onto our double feature. We asked you which cyber thriller from the 1990s you wanted us to review. And these are all notorious films that don't have a great reputation. Uh, We had Virtuosity starring Denzel Washington and an overacting Russell Crowe as a virtual reality serial killer who steps into the real world. Mm Mm-hmm. You didn't pick that. Well, we, we should have been a little bit more explicit. Sid 6.7 <laughs> <It's a> very- <laughs> was an amalgam of every serial killer known to man. Mm-hmm. Sort of, they, they took all of their most evil properties and digitized them and mm-hmm. made a single being inside the computer as a training simulator for cops. Yeah. And at no point when someone Which was is, like programming this, like, isn't this evil and stupid? Yeah. Yes, but this is what we have grant money and, for, so we're it, doing and it. And it turns out Sid 6.7 escapes into the real world and starts serial killing everybody. The other one we had as an option was Johnny Mnemonic, starring Keanu Reeves as a courier with a hard drive in his head. Mm. And you put the you input your computer stuff into his head and he takes it to someone else. And now, the, but the stuff the, in his head is too valuable and people the, are chasing him. The safest way to transport information in a world where everything is being hacked is just to wet wire it straight into somebody's brain. Yeah, as opposed to you really could just put that on a hard drive. Hard drive. Somebody can take a hard drive. Somebody can take Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, as, as it turns out, you could, somebody can just take Johnny Mnemonic's head and like suck the information out of his brain, so it's, what's it, the point? It's, it's a weird sci-fi movie just for a lot of reasons, but mm. like just the, the sort of between space and where it thought technology was going to go mm. and like what would be really important in the future well, but then, as opposed to what actually is, makes it pretty funny. Well, then, and then we also have like Henry Rollins and a psychic dolphin mm. and there's all kinds of weird yeah, stuff Dolph in that Dolph Lundgren yeah. is like, isn't he a cyborg street Preacher's assassin, or is he, he just a street preacher? He's just assassin? a street street preacher assassin. He's not oh, a cyborg. Sorry, but what you ended up picking uh-huh. was a film that <laughs> was the jewel of the lot. <laughs> oh my god, you, you picked the right. one. I would have had fun with all of those. Right. You picked the right one. Uh-huh. Uh, you picked uh-huh. the Lawnmower Man. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Originally known as Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man, until Stephen King successfully sued to have his name removed. Because the short story that The Lawnmower Man was quote unquote based on Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the movie. Mm -hmm. The short story, if you haven't read it, it's not Stephen King's best. It's about a guy who doesn't want to mow his backyard, and he hires a guy from the newspaper, and it turns out and it turns out he's a satyr. Yeah, he's like (laughs) he's like He's like a forest spirit who just starts eating all the grass and the guy ends up getting killed by it. That's it. Mm. It's really not, It's really kind of a stupid story in a lot of ways. So what they did was they got the rights to that short story and they turned it into a movie about a, a, a guy with a low IQ who was turned into God by virtual reality yeah. and drugs. Uh, Pierce Brosnan... <laughs> Take a moment to like that, moment, just yeah. to think about we, like we, where we how, where we started and where we ended up. We got to walk you through this kind of slow because there's a lot to go through in the lawnmower man. Pierce Brosnan plays a doctor who's been working with virtual reality technology, and he's been using it on chimpanzees mm-hmm. to make them smarter, and it's been successful. However, his bosses want him to inject violent soldier drugs into the chimpanzees to turn them into soldiers. So the first- because. Killer cyber chimps is always where I see the future of combat. So we have, at the beginning of the movie, we have a chimpanzee with a RoboCop futuristic helmet. Yeah, who escapes its cell, mm-hmm. takes a gun, like, guns down people in cold blood. It's great. A chimp shoots a guy in a head. And that's the, that's the in, like, the prologue to the movie. I love, there's just this weird shot, because, like, what happens is they put people in those, like, big life-size gyroscopes, and they, like, fling around yeah, in virtual yeah. reality to, like, simulate, like, a lack of space or whatever. And they, when like Jeff Fahey and Pierce Brosnan are doing it, they're like moving their hands around and mm. making it look real cool. When the chimpanzee is doing it, the chimpanzee is just standing there. I think it's a model. It's definitely, no, they, they wouldn't put a chimp in a gyroscope. I hope not. <laughs> but regardless, it just, it just looks like a chimp toys in like mm. a gyroscope. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it's a laugh out loud, stupid image. But the, the chimp escapes and runs to the local Stephen Kingish town and finds Job, played by Jeff Fahey, who is the local simpleton. He 
is the uh, works the gardens mm-hmm. in the neighborhood, and, and he lives at the local church. He is taken. He is, was taken in by the local abusive priest when he was a young boy. He's an adult. He has the intelligence of maybe a five or six year old, mm-hmm. and he sees the chimp in the RoboCop helmet holding a gun and thinks, "Wow, that's Cyberman!" A comic book character. He's a fan of. Is it Cyberman or uh, Cyberman? Uh, right, it's Cyberman. Yeah. Sorry, you look like Cyberman. He takes him in. Uh, in the director's cut, there's an extended sequence where he faces off with the cops, uh-huh. and they, like he carries the chimp out wearing the helmet, and he thinks the chimp is okay, but the chimp doesn't see Jeff Fahey as a threat. Mm-hmm. I saw I I saw the director's cut a long time ago. Mm-hmm. I saw the theatrical cut again recently, mm-hmm. and the theatrical cut he never meets Jeff Fahey. He mm-hmm. just he shoots some people at the office, and then they shoot the chimp, and that's it. <laughs> that's the whole that's the whole prologue they cut so much out of this well, movie of course the, the yeah the, the director's cut is like literally like 35 minutes longer it's and it doesn't insane. make it good it just makes it make a little bit a little more bit sense. more sense but yeah. that was the impetus to get uh pierce brosnan to meet jeff fahey and pierce brosnan says hey i can maybe i can use my smart drugs on this simple man and i can make him smarter um what was the tagline uh, oh, uh, nat- God made him no, simple. God, God made him simple. Science made him Science a god. Made him a god. <laughs> yeah. Basically, okay, so this isn't one of the movies we picked, but uh, mm. there's a really good adaptation of Flowers for Algernon, mm. a book which I think is still required reading in like a lot of high schools, uh, called Charlie. Sir mm. Cliff Robertson, he was nominated for an Oscar. I don't think he won. Did he win? I don't think he won. Um, but I'd it's have, about, I have to look that up. It's about sure. a, a, a man with a low IQ, mm. uh, much like the Lawnmower Man, who scientists decide to give him some smart drugs and he becomes super smart for a while mm. and but that is a sad story about how he suddenly realizes that the he's, world he's, sucks and he was actually happier yeah, before he's, he's no happier be, in being smarter yeah this is about how virtual reality is another dimension and it gives him godlike powers to oh, turn well, people into bubbles wait, we're not there yet <laughs> no it's gonna <laughs> get, be a while you're ahead of yourself a little bit uh the the s- virtual reality worlds mm. of the lawnmower man our, our early 90s CGI. Yeah, and in fact, there was a lot of them were created uh, kind of independently of the movie mm. by, like, early CGI animators, and yeah, they were there, just sort there of There was a, a really fantastic... Well, I don't know about fantastic. I, I thought it was really great at the time when I was, like... When, when it was still called computer animation, they didn't call it CGI yet. Uh, and... You could go to a video store and buy, like, VHS compilations of, like, early computer animation shorts. Mm -hmm. And there was one called Beyond the Mind's Eye, which was really popular for a while. And uh, that was regularly watched by me and all my peers. Mm -hmm. That It just sort of made its way into our vernacular. So when we saw The Lawnmower Man, we recognized that they had cut in some of these shorts into The Lawnmower Man. Yeah. Kind of retconned the shorts into the story. And I want to make it clear, when you're watching them today, they're colorful, but they don't look very good. The, Mm -hmm. The technology evolved. What are you going to do? I saw this movie in theaters when it came out. I was like nine. I'm trying to remember exactly. Mm-hmm. It was gorgeous. Like I'd oh. never seen anything like it. Like the the wow factor mm-hmm. on Lawnmower Man really blinded my whole generation to just how shitty the movie was. <laughs> because when you see <laughs> I, it on I loved this screen, movie for was, the longest time. Like I, I was defending it for years after I should have. Done. I I when I saw. Uh, when we when we were planning to do this, I was thinking to myself, oh, Lawnmower Man. I remember kind of liking it. It's kind of mm. goofy, but whatever. It's not bad. Five minutes and I'm like, oh, this is terrible it's, and it's always been terrible. Yeah, it's always been terrible. The when, Lawnmower Man is you like... See, you see it when you're 12 or 13. It, it kind of gets under your skin in a for, certain way. You forgive stuff. Yeah, it, You don't understand why some of it's plus, dumb. Plus like, it's violent and sexy, so you can kind of pretend that you're watching something adult when you're really not. The Lawnmower Man, I actually equate to mm. the movie Troll. <laughs> in that the sequel what? to The Lawnmower Man and the sequel The sequel Troll, is one of the worst movies of all time. They're both the worst movies mm. of all time. Like They belong in any list of the worst movies of all time. Mm. If you go to like a top hundred... It's going to have Troll 2 on there, mm. and it's going to have The Lawnmower Man 2 on there. Mm. And if it's not, they did not do their jobs. They did not see them. <laughs> you cannot find you, you cannot find positive qualities there. You know, I'm going to look up The Lawnmower Man 2 on Box Office Mojo for a second. Go ahead. Because uh, i, I got to know how much money that thing made. They're really terrible. But the terribleness of their sequels mm. has blinded people to just how bad the original films were. <laughs> Longmore Man and Troll both have some entertaining qualities. They're also really bad movies. Yep. They're just stupid, badly conceived, not well-made mm. movies. 
Okay, so, so the Lawnmower Man 2 Beyond Cyberspace, which was changed to the Lawnmower Man 2 Job's War, for, they replaced Jeff Fahey with Matt Frewer, of all people. Well, he was Max Hedrum. I guess they were going for that. I guess, but I, and I love Matt Frewer. I think oh, he's a too. terrific actor, but yeah, he's he's not right for that role. I think uh, Austin O'Brien came back? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, the kid was the only returning character. Yeah. And, and it took place in the future, and there's... We'll get into the There was this brief moment point. when Austin O'Brien was a really big kid actor like mm-hmm. Macaulay Culkin. Him, but then he like yeah. made a couple of duds in a row, like Last Action Hero, and it just. The Lawnmower Man Two is the 18th highest ranking virtual reality film in history. <laughs> wow! <laughs> um, it made 2.4 million dollars to date, which is <laughs> which is way less than its budget. Yep. It opened in January of 1996. Mm-hmm. Back when January really meant really something. meant something. And guess guess which asshole was in the theater. In the theater, paying money, paying a full price adult ticket to see in the theater Lawnmower Man 2. Because I I liked it. It was me. Yeah. But I digress. (laughs) Someday we'll do Lawnmower Man 2 if you hate us enough, but I digress. Oh, God. Um,. So, the movie continues apace. Mm. Uh, so, a combination of virtual reality simulations and uh, drugs, mm. I think it's mostly the drugs, are making Job smarter. Well, and, and, and sort of like the flashing imagery, and it's sort of like just throwing information into his eyeballs, and the drugs are letting his brain absorb it all. But here's, the, okay, I love the imagery, mm. though, that there's flashing into his eyeballs, because you look at it, and I'm just like, I've read just enough Aleister Crowley to know that some of that shouldn't be there. <laughs> I'm pretty there's, there's sure a, there's a lot of weird occult imagery I'm being thrown into his sure brain as well. I'm pretty sure he shouldn't be putting the occult in. I don't think he needs to know that but, right uh, now. It, it, ha- it happens faster than either of them suspect, but not only does he become fast, uh, smarter and faster, he becomes more competent, he becomes stronger, like his musculature improves. I think, no, I think he was always strong, but he wasn't carrying himself. Oh, okay. Like, that's the thing. Like, he was always kind of, you know... But he, start, he starts combing his hair, he gives up He gives up all of his childhood things, he gives them to his childhood child friend. Mm-hmm. He stands and, up to the priest who's been, like, beating him every night. He starts having having a sexual relationship with one of the women whose lawns he mows, played by Jenny Wright, Mm. who's a great actor people don't talk about enough. Uh, There's a really great, I think, kind of empowering moment uh, with the Jenny Wright character, where people are saying, ah, Jenny Wright, she lives alone, she's rich, she's okay, and... And it was like, oh, she's just sleeping with that guy because she just sleeps around with everybody. She's just, she's, ho- she's horrible. And, and they call her a whore, and it's really terrible. It's really gross, yeah. And then somebody comes to her defense. It's like... Jeffrey, no. uh, Jeffrey Wright. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis. Jeffrey Lewis. Yeah, yeah, great yeah, Jeffrey yeah. Lewis. Great character. Uh, uh, she's like, no, whores do it for money. She's got money. She's young. She does it because she likes it. And I think that was a very good moment of defense. It's like, mm-hmm. she, she can, and why not? Just also... Let, let her be Let her. Be her. Also, <laughs> someone who has sex for money, they, they're people, too. Yeah, let's, let us yeah. not forget that in the, in the course <laughs> he, of this conversation. But well, this is his true. point was: this is an empowered woman. This, yeah. you're you're she, all threatened by her strength, mm. and that's a good point. Mm. And, um, and and he comes to her defense, and I think that's great. And, and uh, Job, you no, know, falls in love with her. They start having a sexual relationship. He begins being able to move things with her mind, and becomes obsessed with. It, it becomes sort of like an addiction to him, getting more and more information. Mm-hmm. Uh, input! And, uh, yeah. Input! Pretty, pretty much he's like Johnny Five, and he ends yeah. up bringing her into virtual reality and ends up, like, scrambling her brain by accident. Yep. Like, he brings her in to, to cyberspace, and they have cyber sex in cyberspace. Okay, mm-hmm. new sex experience. Uh, Fine. Neat. During that, he decides to turn into a monster and, like, stick his tongue into her brain, and I'm wondering, that's not a sex thing, is it? I hope not. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed. Like I don't he think mu- that he mutates into this really terrifying I mean, I, monster. There's enough monster like mm. manga or whatever out there in the world, but mm. like, yeah, I don't know. It, it like, wasn't she established was not, that she was into that. She, yeah. It definitely wasn't established. So I think that might have been part of the problem. Um, he starts getting a god complex, mm. and Pierce Brosnan's trying to like put a stop to the experiment. Meanwhile, Pierce Brosnan is constantly saying things like, "Oh, it's surpassing my expectations," or "I never knew it would do this." And I keep thinking to myself, when I was a kid, I thought Pierce Brosnan was some sort of great scientist. He He's a shitty scientist. He's not conducting any sort of like r- rational order to his experiments. He's, He's just, just sort of dumping giving... drugs and virtual reality nonsense into some guy just mm. to see what will happen. And, he's, and he's terrible. And he's using his lab, which is all like concrete and lit with blue neon because that was just the look in 1991. Yeah. And of course, his bosses secretly switch out the smart drugs with the war drugs. Yeah. So he, he essentially for, for goes insane. Why? He he's goes insane got... and wants to start murdering people and I, become a soldier and i love this thing and i'm sure it's something that like has been thought of 
love or people still doing, but like there's this thing we see in movies and comic books and cartoons where like the government is always trying to create super soldier drugs Mm -hmm. and not just like, we'll just make them strong, but like, let's make them crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, why? What are we getting out of this? Like, hey, this experiment is working and he's super smart and he's getting psychic powers. Great. Let's make him a homicidal maniac. That, Why? That's something because that's, war. That's something that's never sat well with me about the Alien movies. The one persistent theme that's that's been throughout all of the Alien films is that the creatures are meant to be weapons. That's an, an idea that was floated in Alien. It was really made explicit in Aliens, mm-hmm. and uh, it was kind of the, the central premise behind Prometheus and and Resurrection and, and Resurrection that these yeah. things are meant to be weapons. It was like so uh, an unpredictable cockroach monster with an unknown lifespan and no way of communicating is, is a weapon. How do, how does that work? I think the idea was like first off, in the, first, okay. First off, in the original Alien, they didn't know what it was. Yeah, they just knew it's an alien life form. Bring it back. It's probably valuable. That's all they knew. In Aliens, they knew that it was dangerous and deadly, and indeed they were there to exterminate most of them, but they wanted to bring back samples. Mm-hmm. Okay. Alien 3, different different bit, different thing. <laughs> Alien Resurrection, they were studying them. They were mm-hmm. actually studying them. It was a research installation. They were doing horribly immoral things, but there was mm-hmm. study. I'm not sure you can do immoral things to a co- killer cockroach they were, monster. They were, but, yeah. Okay, first off... I think you can, but secondly, uh, they were doing, they were cloning human beings and well, they, doing yeah, horrible the, things. That, that was pretty horrible. Um, and then in Prometheus, we find out that the Xenomorphs and all of those other sequels no longer exist now. Thanks, mm. Prometheus. <laughs> uh, they were created as some sort of biological warfare so, by an alien species. Yeah. And I think the idea was it's basically just like a nerve gas bomb. You're not going to go in there without a mask. You just mm. drop it on your enemy, let it breed, mm. let it kill them all off, and then, I don't let, know, let, then, let they're, and then your enemy's gone, and they're not smart enough to go into space, so just don't go on that planet. <laughs> I think that's the well, idea. Well, and I imagine they die out. Uh, it's, Eventually, it's, it's never right? Been, it's never been said how long those things live. I imagine they only live a couple days, right? Well, they're pretty big. They probably last a while, well, but, but like, they, they have to eat something, right? They're going to run out of stuff. Do, do they eat the people in Alien? I imagine I, they we're, must. We're way off topic now because we don't want to talk about. They the have to eat man, something, but, right? I mean, well, like, not well, how about they just—they just, ex- just are born, grow to enormous size, and then starve to death. Like yeah, that's, that's, that's that's it. That's their life cycle. That's, their that's life a cycle. shitty life cycle. Well, they're just cockroaches. They're just monsters. They're they're not. I guess a short lifespan would be useful in terms of like keeping makes, him down so that they can be used as well. It makes right? sense how fast their metabolism is. You know, it like yeah. just absorbs nutrients from its host, bursts out, mm-hmm. uses those nutrients to grow really big. <sighs> And then it doesn't eat. It just sort of, you know, thrashes about, kills thing, and and dies. I mean, it shoots its like mouth gun or, thing <laughs> through it's, someone's it's inner, head. Its inner mouth, but it doesn't yeah. eat them. Um, that, we don't see that it we chewing. See. That we see in any of the movies. So I'm guessing it doesn't. I'm sorry, do that. we didn't get to have dinner with the xenomorphs. <laughs> I, I, don't I think, think that would have. I never saw you know, over the course of six movies that, or I guess eight movies. That I never made saw ex- James Bond go to the bathroom either. Mm. I assume he does it. I, I assume the aliens don't eat; that they just are born and they die really fast. Although I know there are bits of sketchy mythology that contradict that. Speaking of sketchy mythology, so uh, Job has decided that virtual reality is another dimension, and he hasn't gotten powers from drugs and virtual reality, but he has indeed unlocked the magical abilities that humans used to be able to have, and they were called sorcerers. So Job starts going on a killing spree. Mm. Using virtual reality b- mind bullets. Yeah, like he like turns like Dean Norris. By the way, Dean Norris from Breaking Bad is in this. Uh-uh. Dean Norris is like one of those character actors who was in everything before you realized he was in everything i've seen him in like he was in the firm i just rewatched the firm recently i'm like oh yeah dean norris was in this and he was no one at the time mm. now he's you know celebrated actor good for him um but he turns dean norris into bubbles he just swirly to, bubbles to, 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 he he appears on a lot like he projects an image like a cgi image of his own head like a 10 foot tall image of his own head onto somebody's lawn and then like st- uses that head to stare at two agents and yeah turns them into I-, I thought it was like billiard balls like they they swirl into a bunch of billiard balls and they kind of fly away because we could do that effect now in 1991 there's a really stupid bit there was this one asshole like works at a gas station mm. and he job goes up to him and he puts like a head with a mouth that's a lawnmower inside the dude's brain and it starts like chewing up the brain. Mm-hmm. And then Job says, the lawnmower man is in you now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, the 
hell does that even mean? <laughs> what are you cl- talking about? He clearly like just sort of essentially drove him insane. But like, the- like just by staring at him made him go insane. And a- that was that was pretty cool. He goes to see the priest who was abusing him, and I'm like, you dude, you already fought him off. Like you already proved your point with that yeah, guy. But, but ends but up but immolating him. He does he because I rewatched it, and let me tell it's, you something. It's CGI it's, fire. It's CGI fire from the early '90s. CGI fire today still doesn't look that great. <laughs> <laughs> or see, from the early 90s, I couldn't tell if he was on fire or if he was just turned into CGI stuff. Like, I, I honestly don't what? know. Either way. The one good thing, the one cool bit, is, like, genuinely cool bit, mm-hmm. is when, uh, so, like, the Austin O'Brien kid, mm-hmm. uh, his father is abusive, mm-hmm. and everyone knows that no one's doing anything about it, and he, like, blinks, and Austin O'Brien and his mother fall asleep, mm-hmm. and then he, like, telekinetically floats a giant lawnmower around the house after him, yeah. and it starts chewing through the furniture and stuff, and it's actually really scary, because that would, I can imagine someone chasing me around with a lawnmower, that, it would be that's, terrifying. That's the Anne Rand. Ramsey's basketball scene from Deadly Friend is what that is. But it's like that's this... the best moment in Deadly Friend. <laughs> and it's, it's just that's a perfect example. Yeah. Deadly Friend, by the way, is also one of the worst things ever. It's so bad. <laughs> it's really, really terrible. Not all of Wes Craven's films were good. Yeah, quite a few of them were actually. Yeah. Um, so Job comes to the conclusion that what he really needs to do is download himself into the internet, mm. and uh, which di- didn't quite exist yet. Just sort of upload himself into yeah. The idea they, they call it the mainframe, and the idea is that now he exists. Like his consciousness is now part of, is now electronic. It's well, ones and zeros, and, and he, he believes, is able to spread that information by remote, which was novel in 1991. Yeah, actually, really, this idea yeah. was certainly ahead of its time. And mm-hmm. one, but what he thinks is everyone's going to like use the internet through virtual reality, and then everyone who goes into virtual reality will be in his world, mm. and then he will become a yeah, god. Yeah, pro- project your consciousness as well into the the mainframe. Like it almost sounds smart, but the way you watch it in the Lawnmower Man, it sounds really fucking stupid. And, but to be fair, the climax of the movie, which takes place inside the mainframe, it's all CGI animation, uh-huh. where Job has projected himself in and becomes the sort of weird looking CGI version of himself. Uh-huh. I, I like that scene. I like the scene where he has turned into this big CGI monster and is confronting Pierce Brosnan within the mainframe and is trying to get out and they're really trapped. I think it's, it's well, it, I think it's good use of the animation in translating into pretty decent cinema. You're wrong to like that. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I just rewatched this uh, yesterday. This that scene, I thought it was badass when I was a kid. Mm. It's so awkwardly filmed, and the the CG animation is. And I know it's early, and I want to be forgiving for that. Mm. But just as a storytelling thing, like it's just really awkward and shitty the entire thing. Mm. And the story, like the whole. <laughs> It, the whole plot it, it, is ridiculous because, like, the idea is that Pierce Brosnan is going to try to. He's unplugged the mainframe from any sort of other server, so Job mm. is stuck in there. And then he's going to blow up the building, and he's got these explosives, and he's going to do it. And he's just trying to stall Job so Job doesn't find some mm. other way out. And while he's very poorly fighting off Job in virtual reality, mm. uh, Austin O'Brien. I guess his mom fell asleep in the car, so Austin and Brian just runs up to the building, and there's no justification for that. It looks and, really and, dumb. And he's running down like the buildings of the the quarters of this huge building. He's never been in it before, and but just he knows keeps, exactly uh, where to go. And he, yeah, he just keeps yelling, "Job, jo- why are you looking for Job right now? What is going on in yeah, your life? How did your mom fall asleep right now? There's so much going on. A guy just ran out of the car. Says in 15 minutes, I'm blowing up the building. You can see right there. Right. You fell asleep. <laughs> I'm wrapped with suspense if I'm in that car and Job finally like lets Pierce Brosnan go if he saves the kid and Pierce Brosnan saves the kid and Job finds a back door at the last possible second and you can't and I thought when I was I still think this moment is okay Mm. where like you can't tell if Job made it out or not well they time it in a way like he's just perfect he just solved it and he's he's like in the midst of escaping when the bomb blows up and before Job downloaded he Mm. said as that little monologue we we quoted at the beginning Mm. of the podcast (laughs) uh, that when he when he arrived Mm. like every telephone in the world would ring in unison to announce his his godhood Mm. and the movie ends like a couple of days later Pierce Brosnan and Austin O'Brien his mother they're all gonna leave Mm. and every phone in the world rings. And I gotta tell you, it sounds stupid. And then, and, and then is, cut to black. It's, that's the end of the movie. It's actually not a bad ending. There's mm-hmm. certain, there's, there is an ominous quality to it. Like, oh God, what does that mean? The rest of the movie is so unbelievably stupid that you cannot mm. take that seriously in a million years. 
we, we were a little too eager to jump to the extremes of technology in the early 90s. Sure. Virtual reality was still kind of new, and everybody assumed it was going to be the next big thing. Uh, last year, everyone thought it was going to be the next big thing, too, and already it's <laughs> kind, of, kind of shuffling off People are Buffalo. doing interesting things with the medium right mm. now, now that it's cheaper, now that people are actually have access to it, mm. but... I think it's ultimately rather limited because it's so absorbing. People need to be able to multitask while yeah. they absorb media. So I think, but well, they don't need to. It's just what we're used to. Well, people listen to the radio while they drive their car. You mm. can't use virtual reality while you drive your car unless you get a self-driving car. But in case you haven't heard the news, those aren't always doing well. <laughs> yeah, there have been a few incidents now where, yeah. they're, where they're murdering people. Um, that's that's okay. That's that's an exaggeration. But no, the cars are no. crashing. Okay. They're, 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 that, they're, that's the sort of thing someone can get mad at us for. Like oh, they're not okay. killing they're, people, but like they're not killing people. They're still but, working yeah. out the bugs on yeah. that. Let's just say that you didn't hear the story about the one that grew arms and started robbing liquor stores. <laughs> it's a self-driving Uber that started robbing liquor stores. <laughs> the car did. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. You That's I'm, I'm writing a movie in my head now. You should be sorry. Um, yeah, the lawnmower man is unbelievably stupid. Uh, it it does hit a sweet nostalgia spot for me because I watched it so many times as a youth. I've probably seen this movie like ten times, yeah, but I, sw- I haven't I, seen it in like twenty years yeah, and, until and, I saw it again. I'm so glad I finally did because yeah, this, this movie sucks. The CGI was really <laughs> mind blowing at the time. It, it dated very quickly. Uh, like I said, I was one of the only people who went to see the sequel in theaters. Because I was still enamored of the original, and I was defending this to adults like <laughs> last week. L- well, no, <laughs> like in like well into my high school years, like uh, long long after I should have been defending it. Um, it's not good. It's not, not good. good. I I kind of kind of had to turn my back on it and have a, a, a reckoning <laughs> about myself <laughs> at some point. Um, but we are going to pair it with a really terrific uh, virtual reality movie that actually came out uh, also in the 90s, in 1999, yep. uh, shortly after The Matrix. But before we get to that, I mm. want to talk about mm-hmm. uh, the suggestions you all oh, had. Oh, yeah, yeah. As, you may, as, you, as I hope you know, and if you're new to the podcast, maybe you don't, over at uh, Schmoville! Exclamation point, uh, we have a poll every week, and you get to pick uh, the movie. That we're going to review the Notorious movie, and we pair it with a good one. And then once Whitney and I uh, decide on a good movie, or once Whitney and I decide on that mm. on that good movie, we ask you to predict mm. which good movie we have selected. And you picked some really good choices, and we want to give a shout out. Someone did predict it correctly. Okay. Uh, first uh, comment was rather on the nose, but it's apt. The Matrix. Mm-hmm. Um, the first Matrix is great. It's a really good movie. The first Matrix is very good. Uh, Someone suggested Lucy, which is an interesting, completely (laughs) insane movie about someone becoming super smart and godlike. Uh, Someone suggested A Beautiful Mind, and I see Mm. what you did there about intelligence sort of Mm. backfiring on somebody. Uh, Let's see what we got here. The first person to get it right was Eric Cooper. Eric Cooper kind of hedged his bets a bit and guessed a few things at once. Aww. Amongst them, Strange Days, which I see. Mm. I don't think it's truly great, but it's a good flick. Uh, Videodrome, which would have made sense. Yeah. Uh, but, but but also, I, I love Videodrome. But also David Cronenberg's Existence, mm-hmm. uh, which Whitney is a huge fan of. I am. I have a few mixed feelings about but I do think it's, it's pretty great. Um, but before we get on to that, a few of the other uh, options. For the, uh, Michael Campbell suggested Ex Machina, which mm-hmm. I can see how that works. That, okay. That's pretty, okay. pretty great. Uh, Jack Pollan suggested Tron. I'm a bigger fan of Tron Legacy myself as a movie. I think the mm-hmm. original Tron is a bit stodgy. Uh, <laughs> good stuff in there, though. Uh, Topher White suggested Sling Blade. And actually, mm. yeah. Okay. They're actually very similar in a lot of ways. <laughs> Structurally, Sling Blade is the good version of Lawnmower Man. Um, <laughs> Just without the virtual reality. Basically. Uh, Galen Shumway suggested the 1995 version of Ghost in the Shell, which I think is indeed a classic. Uh, someone suggested the 13th floor, which I actually haven't seen. It's okay. Okay. I know some people who are big, big fans of it. Uh, Matt Adams suggested War Games. We almost did War Games. We, t- we talked about War Games. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big, big, big fan. Um, let's see. Charlie was suggested. We already uh, name-checked that. Uh, and big credit to Jamel Johnson for picking a movie which, if I had thought of it, I would have pushed for. But we had already made our decision. Hmm. Paprika. 
<laughs> paprika is a really good pick. Paprika we'll, we'll, is brilliant. We'll, we'll probably get to paprika. At some I'm a point, huge fan uh, of anime director Satoshi Kon. Mm. Uh, I think he directed some of the best movies of the last like 30 years. Um, and Paprika is a film about people who have technology to invade people's dreams. And Christopher Nolan definitely saw it before he made Inception. He like name checks multiple shots. Yeah, it's. A really brilliant motion picture. Anyway, there's a ton of mm-hmm. stuff on here. Uh, you he guys ripped, off, he ripped off, I mean, paid homage to yeah. Paprika. Um, uh, but yeah, we ended up going with David Cronenberg's Existence, which came out in 1999, uh, when... We were trying to be a little bit more thoughtful about virtual reality rather than just sort of staggering into these weird scenarios that would could never possibly have come to fruition. Yeah, between The Matrix and Existence, we had mm. gone past, oh, virtual reality will be neat, mm. and gone to, okay, but like if there's if a... You can't if there's tell a, the difference. If there's a fictional reality and you can't tell the difference between reality and, and, and fiction anymore, mm. there's a lot to explore. And while The Matrix had big ideas about... Um, sort of dystopian existentialism. Mm. Existence is actually more about sanity and also religion in a lot of unusual mm. ways. Uh, evidently, and I, I remember reading a, an interview with David Cronenberg, how he was inspired to make Existence. Like he wanted to make a, a science fiction film about like a religious fatwa. Yeah. Uh, after he had a, a conversation with Salman Rushdie, because mm-hmm. Salman Rushdie was like hiding from a fatwa against him, so he mm-hmm. was like, well, "What if I did this in sort of a science fiction way?" Yeah. What if a scientist um, did something that various mm-hmm. religious uh, extremists thought was so mm-hmm. unnatural that they basically have decided to mm-hmm. have him killed and everyone who believes in this will want to kill that person and that person is played by jennifer jason lee she is a allegra geller is her name she is a video game designer who creates virtual reality video games and sure enough we haven't done a david cronenberg film on this uh series yet have we i don't think we have david cronenberg is a filmmaker who is absolutely brilliant i think he's one of my favorite filmmakers Mm. period um but he's one of those filmmakers whose last name has now an adjective (laughs) <laughs> you can say Hitchcockian, you can say Cronenbergian. Cronenberg has an unusual, and I don't mean bad, just rather pointed fixation on biology. Uh, people use the phrase body horror to describe his films a lot, and that's true. Uh, there's a lot of uh, rot and decay of the being mm-hmm. in his movies. Look at his, his remake of The Fly, for instance. That's yeah. that's a cancer movie. Yeah, it's, it's, he, it's, he took a movie that was about a guy who turned into a fly, and the original movie is fun. I like that movie a lot. Oh, it's the, a good the original movie. quite good. But he basically said, here's a story about a guy who turns into a fly, but what if I made that an elaborate metaphor for dying from a degenerative disease? Mm. And, 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 and that's watch, what watching makes, that happen to a loved one. Yeah, That's what makes his remake... Mm-hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> it's so good. It's brilliant. And uh, Existence is no different. Uh, it, he makes science fiction movies, but he's not really interested in gleaming tech or future worlds. In fact, he's interested in just the opposite. You watch Existence, and it's actually the most frills-free of his movies. In a lot of ways. Um, they're, like People don't even wear, wear jewelry in this universe. It's just <laughs> like gray sweaters and brown pants. Mm-hmm. Somebody it, has it all a, takes place in the countryside. Yeah, the, it, the, these, There's like all of these test meetings to test out brand new video games. But yeah, they're like in churches yeah. and wooden cabins out in the woods. Yeah, and it, it, people, looks like, it looks like a religious uh, event. The, the, the Jude Law character uh, has a, a cell phone, but it's like this squishy red light-up thing. It's the only thing that looks like any sort of technology and the video game itself l- looks like it looks like a fetal chicken it looks like an embryo i don't mean like the actual and we don't mean like the game itself like you're playing it like, like the console the, the, itself so here's the console mm. in existence everyone has a port now you would imagine like oh we have a virtual reality port we probably put that in our brain or something yeah. right or like connect it to our neck or something it's at the base of your spine it looks like an anus it looks very much like an anus. And what happens is you plug a fleshy... Umbilical cord yeah. thing. Yeah. You plug it into your spine. You got to put a little lube on there. Mm. It's weird. <laughs> and then the game pod that you touch in order to you kinda, you kind of like, interact. Kind of flick it and massage it a little bit. Yeah, and, it, it looks and it like a... pulsating and moving a little bit. It looks almost entirely, but not unlike a sexual organ. <laughs> it's not, but uh, it looks it's, like it's, it's sort of like it's if meant you to squint, evoke that, yeah. If you squint, you're 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 doing something obscene, mm. and 
when you're inside the game, you are incapable of telling the difference between reality mm-hmm. and anything else because it's actually hooked into your nerve system, so you're feeling everything. Yeah. And indeed, on top of everything else, while you're inside this virtual world, uh, there are also, and this was actually one of the things that Existence does that almost no other movie about gaming does, mm-hmm. is it deals with the idea of scripting. Now, if you don't know what scripting is, um, okay. <laughs> okay, so in a game like Pong, or Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers, um, early Super Mario Brothers in particular, it's pretty straightforward. You just run across and you bounce mm. on stuff. You start on the left or you run right. When you have a video game with a complex series of events, they need to be designed in a, in a simple way. So like, if you go into this room, this cutscene plays. Mm. Um, that's called scripting. You do this, then that happens. That's the script. Mm-hmm. If you don't go in there, that cutscene never plays. You you essentially have to make sure that you use the game and let the script play, like, alternately so that they can play in a certain order. And and Existence is designed in a way that actually, like, there weren't a lot of games like it. There were some computer games, but, like, it's actually designed more like the games we have today, like Elder Scrolls or Fallout, Mm -hmm. where it's actually an open world thing and you find the game as you go. And the characters have dialogue trees. Some are better written than others. And scripting is actually really, really Mm -hmm. important. And you need to be able to figure out what to do in order to make the story go forward. And characters will repeat dialogue until Mm -hmm. you do the thing you need to do in order for the story to go. But it's it's kind of bizarre when you see like live actors doing that. Yeah, And And the idea is that free will... Is and I, Allegra even has a line about it. He's just like, "How much free will do I have?" And she makes a point of like, "How much do you have in the real world anyway?" Because <laughs> you technically you could do anything in existence, but it won't make anything happen. Mm. Um, so there is a script, but the script is so complicated that you don't necessarily know what you're following. Mm. And once you realize that you don't know if you're following a script or not, you realize that sanity is pretty thin. <laughs> it's pretty fragile. Well, and, and just your your own perception has been just completely replaced by this game. Mm-hmm. It's not even a matter of confusion. It's just gone. You, your your perception of what reality is is dependent on the game. And there's a f- philosophical extremists who appear right at the beginning of the movie mm-hmm. who believe that this is not just a social ill, but an evil. Like a, yeah. so, something that God has not intended. And there's an assassination attempt right at the beginning. Yeah, first scene. Where a, a man approaches Allegra Geller, says, death to the demoness, Allegra Geller, and shoots her with a gun mm-hmm. that is made of bones and shoots teeth. Yeah. It's, it's basic- awesome. And, and you know what? As he is shooting, mm. as he is taking this prominent woman in the video game industry, and he is shooting a big biological mm. gun at her. It's hard. And again, this was in 1999. Like, if you did this today, mm-hmm. all you need to do is make it relevant and is have him yell it's about ethics and gaming and game journalism. <laughs> like, because the <laughs> anger at yeah, her yeah. And, and what she has accomplished is almost uniformly coming from men. Mm-hmm. And there is something on top of the, There's this sort of rebelliousness, not just against this technology, but against this very feminine technology. It's a fetus. Mm-hmm. They're connecting to your body um, that is being wholly rejected. By a huge group of people, and they are religious people. There is a lot of layers to this that have nothing to do with the technology Mm -hmm. and everything to do with an evolving world in which these characters live and people rejecting that and wanting to go back as far back as possible. And it's no coincidence that this opens in with like, oh, we're going to test out this new game. Where? At a farmhouse in the woods where you would normally have like... A religious revival show? <laughs> like, no, we're 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 doing this no, for a reason. It, it, in fact, I think it's in a church, isn't it? It's, it's in a church or a barn in, or something. It's in a sanctuary. I yeah. believe it's in a like in an actual church. So it, it's not only just a con- yeah. That's an excellent comment about the way it's sort of like th- these biological things are making the men feel really discomfited, but it's also just the way that. And, and David Cronenberg comes back to this time and time again, how we've come to worship tech over everything else. Mm-hmm. And David Cronenberg is himself guilty of this. Sure. It's kind of weird that his films are so spare when it comes to technology, when he himself is a total tech head. Oh, absolutely. Like his he, films he, are very technically, the technical craftsmanship is, is yeah, insane. Well, and he himself likes to collect you know different kinds of cell phones, and he's really familiar with all of the widgets out there. And he's even advocated, he really liked when DVDs came along because you could skip around and remix movies 
movies at will, which, you know, other filmmakers were bristling at. Like, David Lynch is like, no, start the movie and watch the whole thing. Yeah, David Lynch didn't want his movies to have chapter stops, and some mm. of them don't. Some of them don't. Like, you get his version of Eraserhead, it's one chapter, the movie. Watch it, all right? Yeah. <laughs> watch the sk- whole thing. What, do you want to skip ahead? Why? I gave you the whole movie in a, in a certain order for a reason, whereas David Cronenberg said, no, it'd be great if you could do this. What I'm looking forward to is when you can do this. Several films and just sort of skip around and mm. use all of this technology and... You know, his interests lie in using all the latest tricks and tools, whereas his movies tend to preach the opposite. And they're all cautionary tales about how embracing technology is doing damage to your consciousness. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. And, like, what's interesting is as this movie progresses and the uh, Existence game console that Allegra has invented, and it's the only one of its kind, yeah. which means it was stupid <laughs> to do a test run in public with it, but okay. Uh, there are holes in the film. Uh, she needs to go into the game in order to see if it's still working properly. Mm. And there's actually talk about how the game is trying to tell them things about itself. And what we see is and that... How the, how the pod might itself might be sick. Like, yeah, the, the game it's, itself caught an illness. It's, when they open it up to see that it's working properly, it's organic in yeah, there. Yeah, they yeah. created a living thing. And when they go inside the game, they're actually in a virtual reality storyline in which they're infiltrating the company that makes the pods Mm. and they make them by basically mistreating mutated amphibians and like horrifically Mm. mutilating them and transforming them into products and 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 eating them as well yeah and this is the movie (laughs) and so the game is telling you that the game is a is exists out of an unethical practice Mm -hmm. and David Cronenberg is even just saying that the technology itself is fundamentally kind of corrupt and that there is a lot of exploitation that emerges from the from, from tech from so, tech from progress but, and that's another thing that's just fucking true and, and and given sort of the scandals that arose in recent years about iPhones yes. it's particularly salient isn't it about Absolutely. sort of exploiting people to make just sort of casual tech that you're using for fun it's easy to look okay so you look at lawnmower man and its ideas about technology a couple of them were prescient but mostly it looks really hokey mm. Existence doesn't pretend to be the future of technology the technology it has is obviously not what anyone is using But because of that, there's enough of a distance, and you're not saying to yourself, oh, well, it doesn't look like that, so of course it's bullshit. You're looking at sort of this alternate world. Like, this, Mm. just technology evolved a little differently than it does here, and that makes it a very striking allegory. And David Cronenberg knew, I think, just enough about games Mm. and the way that they're made and the way that they're designed and the way that video game storytelling worked at the time, particularly in computer games, like more complicated storytelling computer games. But would eventually become, again, stuff that we play play now, like Fallout, these sort of free-roaming adventures where we can decide for ourselves what the plot is. Um, And he predicted a lot of things that were really going to be an issue. Mm. And he and the things that he didn't predict just feel like an interesting part of this weird tapestry he's created. (laughs) Now, I will say this. Existence, once they actually start playing Existence... I'm not sure it's much of a good game. Well, it, it's it, that's what I like about Existence. Like we've created this complex virtual reality world, and this is not like Ready Player One, where everything's like light up and you're doing these big gigantic races. You're doing exactly what you were doing in real life, and I think that's kind of the point mm-hmm. that people are escaping reality and just going back into reality, and there's no real point to either anymore. Yeah, even and the most if, if you can't if you really can't tell the difference and you have no free will in either realm, then there really is no difference between the virtual and the real Maybe. and that is something to fear and that is something to perhaps rail against so you can kind of understand where the terrorists are coming in and and indeed you can even look at that from the way that uh the internet mm. and social media has evolved as well where the way we behave mm. the way you would talk to the way some people talk to people on twitter or in comment sections is not the way they would interact with most people in real life right there's this sort of divide between reality and unreality, but that's still reality. That's still an actual human interaction, and mm. we're getting divorced from that, and it raises mm. a complicated conversation. I, I like that in the game, uh, there are all kinds of like weird accents. Like You see people, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like the, the indicator that they're fake, Yeah, that they have some sort of strange accent, or like they're this really broad character. Um, it's a character named Darcy Nader, and he has like the fakest Irish accent you've ever heard. Huh? Hello, I'm Darcy Nader. It's like... He's not even trying, and that's the, that's how you can tell that this guy is fake. And I yeah. think that was actually a really cute detail. There's a moment where uh, Allegra, uh, mm-hmm. Jennifer Jason Lee's character, actually bemoans how badly a character she's created is. Yeah, like, it's like it's uh, a badly he's... drawn character. Yeah. That accent is terrible. I, I'm kind of embarrassed. We, we go into the game at some point, and we see it from the Jude Law's character 
character's perspective. And, and he and never just, had like a biopic before. This is the first time he's ever experienced virtual reality. Yeah, he, so he, it's all so we're seeing it through his yeah, eyes. But yeah, fortunately he, he makes that a plot point so it doesn't feel like just an excuse to explain everything. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, they start acting out their characters and it's interesting because uh Allegra Geller is an experienced gamer and she just sort of throws herself into this and mm-hmm. he needs to be walked through it all. And as but a result, she, she starts walking him through and I wasn't, I was confident for the longest time that she was a construct, that she was just going to be like that, an that, NPC. She, yeah. Like she came in and she was behaving in this weird, aloof manner that I thought, Oh, this is the fake version of Allegra, right? Like yeah. we're just going to be lost. We're not going to be sure what's real in this, but she's just, it does, it does, it. it does put a, a, a light as to like what's real and what's really going on yeah, uh, but, in, a, in a, in a clever way. But it also raises, really good topics about not just free will but also the sort of coercion that can take place. I was watching this with my wife Michelle who'd never seen it before and one of the things she commented on is her relationship with Jude Law Mm. where he doesn't want to be surgically altered. He doesn't want things put in his body. And once they're actually in existence and one of the scenes requires them to be romantic, he's uncomfortable with it and wants to stop and she just wants to keep going with the scripting because it's not real. Uh She was making a point that, like, if that relationship were gender switched, it would be insanely uncomfortable. Mm. And that just kind of only supports this really prescient uh, uh, sort of thought about this particular sort of culture and community in which a strong woman makes you really uncomfortable, doesn't it? Yeah. Really freaks you and, out. And any, a lot. Anything about a woman's biology is going to make you really like actual yeah. physical biology. Is oh, yeah. so so freak, now I have out. so now I have like a part of my body that's supposed to be penetrated mm-hmm. with an umbilical cord. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. So, somebody gets licked in one of those. Yeah, it's, really, <laughs> it's kind of creepy. David Cronenberg is really weird, you guys. <laughs> but he, all of his David Cronenberg's weirdness. He can look at it in a vacuum and go, "Oh, it's just weird," and a lot of it is. But no, it's no, weird no, with no, purpose. None of it is just weird. Well, that's not yeah. point. It is weird, but it's weird with purpose. Mm. And when David Cronenberg is on point, and to be honest, he isn't always. He's made a couple of duds. But I, I didn't see Map to... Was it Map to the Stars? Map to the Stars I, is probably um, his worst movie, one. if you ask me. It's not... Well... I, I did like Cosmopolis. A lot of people didn't like that one. I think Cosmopolis is like... I jumped into like a grad school economics class on like the last mm. day. <laughs> and I didn't redo any of the reading and I'm just sort it, of lost. It's interesting, but I don't think I got it. It, it was it was the Occupy Wall Street movement as seen by... a. a Techno fear Canadian. I think David Cronenberg in the later phase in his career has gotten more, uh, less interested in the physical self and more interested in psychology. In fact, mm. he actually made a film about Sigmund Freud <laughs> yeah. and Carl Jung. It's Carl Jung in that, uh, right? Uh, uh, a Dangerous Method. A Dangerous yeah. Method. That movie is great. Yeah, it's, it's Freud and Jung, and Fr- Freud is played by Viggo Mortensen, and Jung is played by uh, um, Fassbender. And uh, Kira Knightley gives her best performance in that movie. She's mm-hmm. really good in that. That's a really good movie, and not enough people saw it. It's really, but it's all about people who are sort of divorced from their flesh mm-hmm. and are only about intellect. And some of his later films are indeed about that. Some better than others. If you Spider is probably his most underrated movie. Spider is really terrific. Spider's and fantastic. that's that's a and great no one talks great about film about uh, mental illness. The way that functions functions and the mm. way that looks yeah the splintered uh mm. psyche mm. and it's absolutely fantastic but when but he it was, was it was sold as kind of like a thriller but it's really just sort of a dark psychological study and yeah. it's just really really intriguing and his movies that people think are just about flesh and and body stuff mm. uh they're about the way we feel about it mm. they're about the way we feel about our body decaying or the way we feel about sexuality or the or, way a twin in, would feel about having another version of yourself. And, and in, in the case of existence, about the way the mind has been forcibly ripped from the body mm-hmm. uh, using technology yeah. and, and how we're using technology uh, as a replacement body. And indeed, when you start projecting your consciousness into sort of the cyber realm, what are you doing but removing your consciousness from your physical body and putting it into the electrical. Yeah. And that's that's where what the lawnmower man does literally, mm-hmm. and it's what Existence does, Existence does uh, conceptually. So I saw both of these movies when I was in my teens. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I was a lot younger when the lawnmower man came out. I saw them both when they came out. And Lawnmower Man, when I was really, really young, I thought was cool because the games looked cool. <laughs> and one of the games and, and does and look cool. There's this one like sort of flying game with a whole bunch of like weird traps and everything like that. It does look neat. That's what the Super Nintendo game ba- was based on. Yeah, I played that. It was it, not good. It was really hard. It was a pretty terrible game. Yeah, it really was. Uh, I rented that from Warehouse. Me uh, too! Yay! Was it the one on Lincoln? No, uh, I was in Pasadena. So uh, I was about warehouse. to say, we could have rented the same cartridge. The warehouse is pretty much forgotten now, but it was another chain of video rental stores that all up Blockbuster and Hollywood Video. The W-H-E-R-E house. Yeah. The where? Wh- the where? Wh- 
the, the warehouse. warehouse. Yeah. Because that's where it's at. Uh, but I wasn't, like, I was young. I was still, like, I was thinking I was a junior or senior in high school when mm-hmm. Existence came out. And I appreciated it. I was already kind of a Cronenberg fan, but I was a little distracted because. Its idea of what video games were didn't fit my idea of what video games were. Mm. My idea of what video games were were rather narrow at the time. And yeah. what I want people to do, hopefully, you will. If you haven't seen Existence, you will go out and see Existence. It's worth it. Mm. It's interesting. It's weird. It's one of the best films about virtual the the philosophy behind virtual reality. Yes, um, even more so than the Matrix uh, oh, or, yeah. or the Matrix Revolutions, which like just. Gets really like, heady like and weird. Start, starts looking up its own butt and then just dives in. Yeah. But uh, what alienated me was, what what kind of game is this? I don't, I don't really mm. get it. And it wasn't until after I saw Existence that I realized that not only are there different genres of games, but games can exist to give you different kinds of tones. Mm. So if you're going into Existence thinking they're going to go into this virtual reality game and it's going to be total badass and they're just going to shoot everybody, it's mm. going to be really cool. Uh, try to think of it this way. Think of it more like they're entering Silent Hill. Some really creepy, atmospheric game. Mm. And that's a different vibe. And Existence is more about that vibe. Mm. Um, So that would be my recommendation, is to keep that in mind as you uh, explore Existence. It is worth it. It is interesting. It's not talked about as much as it used to be. And it's a shame. It kind of got overshadowed by The Matrix. The the Matrix came out first. I think The Matrix was a July release, and I think Existence came out like a month and a half later. I'm pretty sure Matrix was an April release. Oh. uh, Because I was still in school. Okay, Okay, I guess The the Matrix, it came out later in the year. And a lot of the critics were saying, oh, well, this is a film that's actually really thoughtful about what we're doing when we're trying to project ourselves into virtual reality, mm-hmm. whereas The Matrix was more or less a thriller about that. Matrix was March 31st, 1999. Oh, okay. I think Existence might have been an August release. Which, I'm going to double check. So it wasn't, Existence was April, only one month later. Oh, really? April that, that early? Okay. And so, yeah. Th- there one were pe- right after the pe- other. People saying, you know, okay, we're, we're fascinated with this, but it's like two opposite views. One is the fantasies that can that you can create and sort of the artificiality, and this is what virtual reality will look like. And then, it, yeah, had this weird sort of uh, philosophy 101 version of, of uh, existentialism where it's like, but what if there's like a, a, a decept... What was, was Descartes' phrase? The deceptor who's trying oh. to fool your mind into thinking that this isn't real and the only way to make sure you're real is you're thinking, man, and it turns out there's these evil machines man and, and, <laughs> and man it's so really great you know the matrix is deep if you're high uh, yeah and there's also and i think it's, these were not long we already mentioned the 13th floor which i haven't seen but had a bit of a cult following yeah and it came out just after dark city as well yeah and dark dark city is super great really really fantastic it's doing different things but it's also mm. talking about a, a world that can be manipulated and cannot be trusted mm. um and on, again i haven't seen 13th floor all of those are good movies well, 13th floor that, is not that the other ones are good movies <laughs> yeah. on different levels okay um and existence is a different version of that and i think it might be a bit mm. more heady than something like the matrix which is has a lot of kung fu fights yeah, this uh, doesn't have any action there's no action in existence there's a couple of like Gunfire. There, there, there's, like, there's, a, there's a there's a gun and there's that cool bone thing that shows up mm-hmm. twice in the movie. And there's there's a bit of mayhem towards the end, but it's all mm-hmm. in the background. It's actually almost like a joke. Yeah. Like the actual part of the video game most people would be excited to play is not the it, point it's, at it's, all. It's literally going in the, on in the background while the two main characters are just having a conversation about what's really going on here. Yeah, it's actually like I, I wonder if that was a reference to Alfred Hitchcock's The 39 Steps because the end of that oh. movie is <laughs> the end of that. I'm not going to tell you how the movie ends. But the end of the movie is they're explaining everything, but while they're doing it. You're getting drowned out by can-can dancers because ultimately <laughs> what was happening, why stuff was happening was not the point. The point was the show. I feel like that's a bit something mm. that he's referencing in Existence. Mm. Maybe I'm thinking too much of it. Uh, but it's a great movie. Mm. And uh, you should absolutely check it out. So next week on Critically Acclaimed, uh, Whitney mm. thought it would be fun. Well, actually, this was an idea of my wife's. So I have to give oh. this credit, all, all this credit to Angie. So. Oh, okay. Uh, your, your wife had mm. the idea to do... There's a lot of bad movies about dragons. In fact, there aren't very many good movies about dragons. There's a few. Dragon Slayer is pretty kick-ass. I love Dragon Slayer. I haven't seen Dragon Slayer. You really need to. It's a good flick. Uh, Dragonheart is okay. I kind of don't care about dragons. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like it's it's difficult for me to get excited about a dragon. A dragon is is a kind of thing that, for most of cinema history, impossible to make look good. Mm. It was a cool idea, but we didn't have the technology to make it look cool. It and mostly in, it didn't. It looked good in one movie, and we're going to let you choose from that one. 
<laughs> well, no, it's Dragon Slayer. Pardon? Dragon Slayer. Let's okay, Dragon fine, Slayer. Dragon Slayer. Uh, and you could argue Desolation of Smog. There's a few. Yeah. Uh, Desolation of Smog. So we're going to talk about three of the more notorious dragon movies, yeah. and you get to pick. Uh-huh. Your first pick is Dungeons and Dragons. The uh, based, based on Gary Gygax's famous role playing game, this low budget horror, <laughs> starring. <laughs> Starring Jeremy Irons and the rest of Jeremy Irons. <laughs> Jeremy Irons gives one of the most insane performances I've ever... Just one of the best... Like him and Raul Julia in Street Fighter the movie. Just <laughs> overacting like maniacs. Trying to save this stupid cheap uh, material. This is a movie... I, I'm Again, you can pick whatever one you want. But this is a movie in which the, the actor who plays the dwarf is clearly taller than the rest of the cast. We have Tall Dwarf. This is the Tall Dwarf movie. I'm just saying it's an interesting yeah. choice. Um, okay, your other option. D-War. A big budget Korean action movie with like American actors who you recognize kind of, but they're treated like big, big stars. And it is big and it is dumb and no and one gave a crap. And it's incomprehensible. You, like you can't, can't can't figure this thing out. I don't know what the hell is going on. I, I've seen D War. I've seen D War. I watched too. it with the with the riff tracks. That was the only way to really get. <laughs> no, I've, it. I've seen. I saw D War yeah. proper. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll, we yeah. that's another option. And then lastly, Aragon, which I think also has Jeremy Irons in it. Does it? Does it? Holy crap! No. Does, does it really? Is, is it is it Aragon, Aragon or is it Iragon? Like as in rhymes with dragon. I thought it is was it, Aragon. Is it Iragon the dragon? I think it's Aragon the dragon. Aragon the Dragon. 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 Aragon. Yeah, Jeremy Irons is in two of these. Hooray! <laughs> Yay! We can't lose unless maybe D War. Um, you, know, you know, he worked with David Cronenberg <laughs> <laughs> several times. Uh, his best performance is in Dead Ringers. Dead Ringers. Yeah. And, and you know what? He wasn't bad in M Butterfly. Okay. That's that's the Cronenberg people don't talk about a that's, lot. But M Butterfly is quite good. That's very true. I haven't seen that in many years. Uh, so those are your three options. Uh, Aragon was a, uh, a YA franchise that did not take off like most of them um we could have done a poll of nothing but like failed ya friends we still could there's no shortage we'll do that next week (laughs) there's no shortage of 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 failed ya movies do freaks and ink hearts and all the rest of those um so those are your options for next week uh in the meantime uh next week we'll also be reviewing incredibles 2 tag and superfly Probably amongst other things. Um, and uh, we have time for some letters. Okay. So we're going to read some... We get some sacks and sacks of letters. It, oh, letters. If you want to write to us, we actually have... Uh, we're still reading letters from our old email address, which uh, was critically acclaimed uh, fans at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And we'll still re- we'll still get your email. And we'll still, we'll that. still get your email. We're still going to be checking that one, but we set up a new one. Yeah, it's letters at critically acclaimed dot net. Mm-hmm. So send us uh, your letters, send us your questions, uh, your responses. Do you agree with the review? Disagree with the review? You have uh, uh, anything you want to talk about at all? We have a lot of we have a lot of interesting ones this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to start here uh, with a letter from Chris Wong. Okay. Chris Wong says, I made the mistake of reading some of the comments on your reviews at IGN. Oh, golly, don't do that. Why is it so awful? I know the general suggestion is to ignore comments, but do these posts about, quote, SJWs, end Mm. quote, get to you in some way? How long Mm. did it take you before you stopped worrying about, quote, critics about your critiques? Um, We can't control comments. Yeah, we 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 can't. People can write any comment they want, and uh, different websites have different uh, crowds. And IGN is has been really great to us, but they have a very young demographic, and mm. sometimes the comments are are it, not nice. Not not could could perhaps be more mature. Yeah, um, and that's disappointing because mm. we're trying to you know. I feel like there's an idea that people want their critics or the people who write about entertainment to have the same attitude and set of knowledge and tastes as the people reading it. Mm. I understand this. I also find it rather boring because it doesn't give you any room to grow. I think Mm. when you look at the people who... Uh, write material for you. I would want them to know more than me. Yeah, I would want yeah. them to have seen more movies than me. I would want them to guide me to more interesting experiences rather than tell me stuff I they I don't need to be told because I can just see it and come up with mm. that. Um, there's there's a tendency from a lot of uh, of readers 
and we we butt up against this all the time where like what is the function of film criticism mm-hmm. and how objective can should you be the answer is not objective at all this is a film review it is an opinion piece mm-hmm. it is an editorial and it's it needs about to art be, which is subjective to begin so with so it needs to be 100 percent subjective and i think well okay i have i think it's a little bit more nuanced uh, well, than that I, I suppose so but that 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 is sort of what we're looking at that is the function of a review and a lot of and, people say like oh i can't believe you you reviewed overboard when you saw the original you should have been objective and mm-hmm. i'm like you don't complain with people who know about batman review a batman movie <laughs> the issue here isn't is about okay just to get on the subjectivity thing mm-hmm. We are subjective. We're human beings. We bring our own experiences to it. Mm. As a critic, we have to be honest about that and articulate. And when we say we feel a way about a movie, we have to explain why we do that. Mm. That's where the objectivity comes in. You need to be able to pull yourself back enough to understand why you have this reaction. And you need to be intelligent enough about the art form, about yourself. That's something people don't always think about. To express that clearly. And to be honest about it. Mm. You have to be honest. That's it. Um, when people talk about uh, sort of saying like, oh, I can't, I, I have to not review this because I know the people who made it, that you do that because you feel like you couldn't be honest. Mm. You would want to spare their feelings. Or, or at the very least, uh, there would be some suspicion as to your honesty. Exactly. And so you want to you mm. avoid that because that's what's valuable. When it comes to people saying things like, oh, you're a social justice warrior. First off, thank you. <laughs> that's a great thing to be. All the greatest superheroes um. ever created were warriors for social justice. Justice. Mm. They're fantastic. Thank you for that. Mm. Um, I don't. I, I mean, it bothers me that it is seen as a pejorative because I find that um, says that says a lot about the people who are writing that. Mm. Um, but um, we're we're not. If you just want someone to tell you, oh, that looks neat, you don't need a critic. Why are you reading any criticism? Mm. If you want to talk about people who talk about the way that art. Popular art, artsy fartsy art, all kinds of art, actually, what it has to say about people and society and the human condition and the way that people who are hopefully articulate about art and culture are responding to these things. That's what critics are here for. Yeah, we're, you don't need we're, critics for other stuff. We're we're, tra- we're trying to dissect uh, the place of uh, of a certain film, and as we've said in previous podcasts, all art is political in that mm. it is uh, an object of the times that produced it, and it is and either affirming can, values or it, it, and is it is challenging, it, them. and it is expressing a certain set of every film is ex- expressing a certain set of values, even and if it's if just everything is fine the way it is. Yeah. That's political. That's that's we're, saying a comment about mm, the world, about us, especially as it exists right now and how this film sees the world is a, a, an important thing to comment on uh, if you're going to be a good critic. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that notion that a film mm-hmm. is expressing something that is in the world, whereas a lot of people use films uh, perhaps differently. To escape the world. To, they, yeah, they're trying to sort of flee from the world rather than go to a film to affirm, disaffirm, comment on, or, you know, absorb a piece of beauty about the world Mm -hmm. uh, that is actually out there. Uh, So when we're writing something saying, this is what it is being, you know, sensitive about, this is what it's being insensitive about. This film is viewing the world in a way that we find to be kind of irresponsible. We're going to get the people who are using films just sort of as, as light entertainment, a little bit up in a huff because they think we're flying against the notion of what cinema is supposed to be doing. And as a result, I don't understand where the anger comes from or well, where because, sort of the rancor comes from. Well, I think it's because a lot of people define themselves through the art that they enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and but so these, when, it's, when that, when that art is right? challenged, you're not just challenging. We're not just saying, mm-hmm. oh, I don't like this. We're saying there's the interpretation that, okay, for example, mm-hmm. uh, the, the DCEU movies have a lot of passionate fans. And if you say the movies are bad, they'll, sometimes they'll come at you. Mm-hmm. And I get they like those movies. That's fine. I like some of them. <laughs> Some people don't like any of them. Some people like all of them. That's fine. But when I like, I like two of them. If you say you like you you, if you if you're a kind of person who loves them so much that they partially define your being, hmm. um, and then someone says they think they're all bad, it's easy to interpret that as well. Those these films define me, so they're saying I'm bad. Hmm. I understand having a negative reaction to that, but that's. 
kind of on you a little bit for putting too much of yourself in only one place. And it, but it's not necessarily... It's a dangerous thing to do because it can make you really unhappy. Yeah, and they're not necessarily reacting to us saying, your films are bad and therefore you're bad. It's us writing a maybe a thoughtful review saying, this is a point of view that this film espouses. Mm-hmm. Whether that is good or bad, this this is what I have observed. Yeah. And they the, the response is never, I, I disagree, I think the film is actually pointing out this. It's always... How dare you, social justice warrior, add any note of thought or sensitivity or cognizance mm-hmm. to something that should only be interpreted as light entertainment? Yeah. And that's mm. only one way to do it. Mm. That's really That really is. There's only one way to do that. And again, you don't need critics for that. Another thing I get a lot of is, uh, oh, everything he, he likes, I hate. And everything mm. he hates, I like. Well, that's a good critic, isn't and it? And then I've done my job. Yeah, you, because you understand where I'm coming from. You and you can make a decision based on that. If you understand the critic's point of view, and you understand what they're saying, and you disagree with them all the time, mm-hmm. continue reading that critic. Because that you will be able to sort of figure out your own view on films a little bit more sharply. Yeah, I, I'm bummed that people you, consider that a negative thing about me, but I'm mm. actually flattered that by reading my stuff, you've gotten mm. to, my voice has been clear enough that you've been yeah. able to make that, and that it is, is it, that, that is consistent. Mm. That's, that's a good thing. We all have different tastes. And yeah. there's a lot of people out there who, like, I love their taste. Like, uh, um, Alonzo Duralde is a brilliant critic. I love him. He's a good friend. Mm. I trust his decisions. He doesn't know the horror genre as well as I do. And so sometimes, like... He he looks for different things. Like, if Alonzo Duralde says says he likes a horror movie, I don't necessarily... I take that with more of a grain of salt than if he Uh tells me a drama is good. One of my uh, my favorite film critics working is Amy Nicholson. She's really great. And uh, I was actually on her podcast. It was very flattering Mm -hmm. that she allowed me on the canon. We talked about The Tingler, and The Tingler didn't make it into the canon. I'm upset about that to this day. And you should be. That's lame. (laughs) Tingler's brilliant. I so rarely agree with Amy Nicholson, sure. but she is so well reasoned and she's such a good writer and she thinks about things in ways that I wouldn't have that I'm grateful to read her perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's different voices, different ideas and being aware of them and understanding them. That's why we go to art in the first place. <laughs> if you're only looking at art as escapist entertainment, mm. that's your prerogative, but you don't need to read about it. Mm. You can just watch it. You don't, if you're reading about it, you might run into a different idea. Yeah. And you really shouldn't be upset about that. Yeah. And uh, I, I used to read re- uh, comments on my reviews because I got them so infrequently. So whenever it happens, like, oh, I get a comment. What's it? Yeah. Oh, you're going to cuss at me. And then I, wrote a re- <laughs> then I wrote a review for Man of Steel. Oh, that was, was a mistake. It was one of my most <laughs> infamous because re- I hated Man of Steel. And I was very clear about how I hated it. I thought it was just a bunch of noise. There wasn't a lot of emotions in it. It was just... And a, like an assault on the senses and all of the emotions were really mishandled. I just did not like the movie at all. And it was the first time I got like hundreds and hundreds of comments almost unilaterally call, telling me to go to hell yeah. for hating this movie that a lot of these people hadn't seen yet. It wasn't open yet. Yeah, and sure enough, when Man of, after Man of Steel came out, it was less popular than people thought it would be. Yeah. And has any one of those people come back to me to apologize? No. <laughs> not one of them. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I read through a lot of those, like, oh, gosh, this is horrible. Some of them made me just feel bad as a person. Some of them I was able to laugh off. And after that, it's like, you know what? I don't need to read this anymore. I've made myself as clear as I can with my review. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was unclear. I'm just going to write the review and let it be, and I'm going to stop reading comments. And it's nice to know they're there. I'm happy that people are responding, but, yeah, I've I've resolved not to do that anymore. Because all all you do is run into rancor and bile and people who don't really understand your argument or just intentionally ignoring it or aren't even reading your review. They just see your star rating and come after you. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I don't don't read a lot well, of. Well, I talked about this with existence. You know, mm. people don't treat things that happen on the internet as a real interaction. Yeah, and they're just sort of throwing their mm. their id mm. into the world. But it, that's basically just making this big angry ball that we all have to interact mm. with. And I think we're better than that. Mm. I think we can be better than that. And I think, um, you know, mm. it's it's disappointing. To answer the last question. You never quite get used to it because, like, I'm a person. I want people to like me. Who doesn't want people to like them? I've, Wouldn't that be nice? But I, I there's only so much I, I can yeah. do. I, I heard a fellow critic say this about our profession, how we, we dish it out. We dish. When we hate a movie, we'll let you know. But we cannot take it. We are like well, one of those thin-skinned lots. Well, I've explained it this way. Some people have brought that up. Like, oh, God, critics are so bad at taking criticism. Uh, no, I, I disagree with that. Some are, obviously, mm. but, like, some aren't. But... 
for me, what it boils down to is we have made criticism, pointed observations, Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully constructive criticism, but sometimes damnation we feel necessary, um, our jobs, our lives. Mm -hmm. We take criticism seriously. (laughs) So when someone criticizes us, our innate in, in idea is oh well I should take that seriously because I want people to take my criticism seriously when it's made by somebody who is half awake in their bedroom at some point just saying ah, I hate you yeah but like your point is is that my first thought is well I maybe they're inarticulate about it but maybe I did something wrong mm. what did I do how can I make myself better mm. because and then I just immediately go down a rabbit hole of because obviously I'm crap <laughs> like that's and I I, I, I suffer from mm. depression anxiety low self esteem a lot of people do um, and those kind of comments can really hit me hard sometimes mm. fortunately I have a really good support group I have you I have mm. my wife Michelle I have two cats now two cats two cats I have Sergio they're, they're and we have adorable. our kitten Luca who is uh, new to the family and is very cute. <laughs> Um, Luca is still tiny. You can fit Luca in your mouth. Anyway, should, should we go on to another? Let's do another email. Another, do another another, email. Uh, this one comes from uh, Peter. Uh, hi, Bibbs and Whitney. Hello. Uh, it is evident that every medium has its own strengths and stories that play to those strengths and make the masterpieces of that media great. Are there any books that you can think of that should be turned into movies to reach their story's full potential? Interesting. Uh, for me, this would be a book that you have not read. Um, Ek was Ek was here. I don't know that one. I don't know. Uh, the second half of which, once getting past the obnoxious teenager stuff and creepy stalker stuff, could make a really good movie. This book was hampered by a main character who is describing visual metaphors and what they meant to the reader, which would be better if we just saw the visual metaphor. Hmm. Also, are there any books that should never become a movie because they would be <laughs> impossible to translate to screen? For me, it would be The Catcher in the Rye, which I love, uh, yeah, because a Rye movie be- would be the worst. I think A Catcher in the Rye movie would be pretty dull, actually. <laughs> I don't think it's... I, I, think, I, think, I think just doing that, in theory, would the, be like the most pretentious thing you could possibly do. The, the Catcher in the Rye, uh, like as a film, might be able to work, but the very notion of having a Catcher in the Rye film would be so offensive just across the board <laughs> that I, I wouldn't want to see that. I, so I just can't. stay, just stay away from the Catcher in the Rye. It can stay unadapted. I don't. Have, We're good. On I don't the Catcher actually have strong opinions about this. Mm. I don't feel like there's a lot of books that well, I've read that mm. were bad because they were books, or maybe could be even better as movies. There's a lot that could be great movies. I would um, love to see Patricia C. Reed's Enchanted Forest Chronicles turned into a movie series. That would yeah. be one of my favorite things. I, I would, but I think they're great books, so I don't care. I would like uh, my favorite children's book, The Snark Out Boys and the Avocado of Death, to be adapted to a feature film. That would be nice, because that's about kids who have made a sport of sneaking out of the house at night mm. uh, to go see all-night midnight movies. So it's a, you know, a movie about the movie-going experience for kids. I think that would be a really fun uh, feature was, film. But hmm. if you're looking at just sort of literature in general... And you're familiar with sort of the way literature has evolved and the way the novel came into being and the way it has evolved into sort of the modern commercial product it is today. You'll notice that books have become cinematic, that a lot of pop lit is only described visually. Like, they'll introduce a character by describing how they look or, like, how the lights you know, strikes them from behind as they stand on a mountaintop mm-hmm. and a, a beam of light hits their face and dramatically bifurcates their features. It's like, that's screenplay writing. Yeah, you're describing the way it looks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, opening still... of, the opening of the Scarlet Letter is like a mm-hmm. zoom in on a rose. Yeah, that's what yeah, it is. It's a, it's, it's a it's, zoom. It, yeah. It's essentially you know it's cinematic storytelling. You, that's why John Grisham was so popular for so long. His movie, his books were essentially movies already. Well, actually, a good example of this mm. of, of books which are good books, mm. but they're better movies is Ian Fleming's James Bond books. <laughs> I like those books. I've read about I think half of them. Okay, and like they're really good and they're really entertaining. Some are better than others, obviously. Like Moonraker, the book is actually really good, Even though and the, the movie the stays really awful. So that's an exception. But like they're so pulpy and visceral mm-hmm. that they're really you you know that like this level of cool and this level of style is meant to be filmed yeah, it is so yeah. much better as a movie than it is when it works mm. than it is in a book yeah. uh, so I, that's one that comes to mind um, I would love to see Cl- I would love to see Moonraker done right done, because you okay. could totally do it because the, the mm-hmm. remake of Cine Royale remake some of the other ones you kind of ignored like you <laughs> took the title and messed everything up like why not 
Who gives a shit? Uh, but, you know, when it comes to, like, some of the great works of literature, like, there have been filmed versions of Moby Dick, but mm-hmm. a film is not going to get Moby Dick because Moby Dick is in its prose, it's in its denseness, it's in its history, it's in the discussion, it's in the interior monologues. These are things that can't be and shouldn't be filmed. And, you know, the actual just visual part of Moby Dick, I'm sure you could make it great. Maybe you could make a version of Moby Dick with no dialogue, mm-hmm. where it's all just sort of told through looks, sort of in a silent movie style that would capture a lot of the feelings of Moby Dick. But Moby Dick is a work of literature, and its strength is being a work of literature. There's a movie that Ron Howard directed a couple years ago called In the Heart of the Sea. Yeah. And it is a gorgeous production. Like, it looks great. It looks okay. I think it looks really good. (laughs) I love movies about the sea. And it's a story about the true story that inspired Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem with that. Moby Dick told the good version of that story. It's already been turned yeah. into a better version yeah, of that story. Yeah, they already told like a good story. The original story, if it was that interesting, it would be Moby Dick. Mm-hmm. What we have is like some interesting like really cool visualizations of the giant whale and the and the attack, but ultimately the the characters and stuff were better served by the literature. Mm-hmm. And the movie itself just feels kind of perfunctory and you start wondering, why didn't you just make Moby Dick? <laughs> Moby Dick would be a better mm-hmm. movie than this. What were you thinking? Yeah, and there are some some books that I really, really love, and they're just so weirdly abstract that you can never adapt them to film. Sure. Like, I've read Ulysses, and that's, uh, you know, that first of all, if you're going to do Ulysses, you have to commit. It took no. me a summer to read Ulysses. Yeah. And you have to you, just let it wash over you the first time. And mm-hmm. there's going to be another time. <laughs> Let it wash over you the first time. Just absorb what you can, and then then start worrying about the annotations. Yeah, um, you can't make a Ulysses film. Can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah, what? what, what like, are you going to watch Leo well, Bloom kind of wandering around town? No, but you can just... take an unusual tack though. Going back to David Cronenberg, cool. Naked Lunch should be unfilmable. Yeah, and David Cronenberg's adaptation of Naked Lunch is really bold and unusual, and in many respects, not even an adaptation well, of was, Naked Lunch. It was sort of a weird, abstract retelling of the right of Naked Lunch rather Mm -hmm. than the things that happened in the book. But they took it in a new direction and they created something new and really interesting. I feel the same way about Michael Winterbottom's Tristram Shandy. I haven't seen that uh, I've I've read the book, Lawrence Stern's uh, Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentlemen. Uh, This weird post, like pre-postmodern book about, you know, sort of the, the joke of the book is that uh, the the narrator sets to tell out his life story, and he gets so distracted by asides and other people in his life and things he's distracted by in the room that he doesn't get to his birth until the last page of the book. <laughs> <laughs> like he, he waits till the very end, and he gets to his birth, and he realizes this has just been a cock and bull story. Ah. So, but Michael Winterbottom made. Tristram Shandy, A Cock and Bull Story, which was about a film production company trying to make a movie of Tristram Shandy and failing miserably. Yeah. And it captures the, that weird postmodern spirit of not being able to get to the point that Lawrence Stern wrote. I really re- recommend Lawrence Stern, by the way. Okay. One of, he was one of Jefferson's favorite authors. I'm actually not that familiar with him, so that's really cool. Yeah, he's kind of an obscure book, and it's a tough read, okay. but it's also weirdly hilarious. Okay. Uh, here's another letter. This is from Todd. Hi, Todd. Todd writes, why do so many critics get hung up on the amount of character development is in a movie as if that were the end-all be-all of the quality of that particular work? I constantly hear people complain about movies that I have thoroughly enjoyed, Mm -hmm. saying things like, quote, the characters didn't learn anything, there was no character development, only one of the 50 characters had an arc, as if this were the only important part of a movie. Why can't people just sit back and enjoy the acting, the visuals, the jokes, and the story? Why does every character have to have an arc? Why can't they just exist and go through a series of fun events leading to an ending? Thank you, and I love your new podcast, although I've never listened to the others. <laughs> Listen to Cancel Too Soon, you can ignore the rest. Uh, here's, here's, okay. You, you can find back uh, episodes of the B-Movies podcast, they're I think, out there. I think when we talk about character development, I think there might be a bit of a misunderstanding. Mm. Because you talk about how, why can't the characters just exist and go through a series of fun events leading to an ending? That is development. Mm. That's a sequence of events. And if you're going to tell a sequence of events that are so meaningless to the characters that it doesn't change them, you start wondering why you're watching that story. That's not a story. Yeah. Um, That's just stuff that uh, happens. Ira Glass, who runs This American Life, has been very uh, very, uh, articulate about this point. How the phrase, like, this I believe, 
is kind of meaningless to him. It's like that you're just describing yourself. You're describing a character, essentially, at the beginning of a movie. Yeah. But the phrase, this I used to believe, is a much more intriguing one because it implies that you went through some sort of change. There's been a story. There was, And that's mm. all, all the screenwriting terms start to come in, into place. There was an inciting incident. There was a big change. There was a resist to the call. There was a, mm. a coming to peace with it. There was not a coming to the peace with it. Uh, so... When people talk about character development, they want to see at least some sort of change in the character from the beginning to the end. Now, if you're watching something like Indiana Jones Mm -hmm. or James Bond, who are fully formed when they enter the screen, and I love characters like that as well, and that's just a series of adventures that the character has, Mm -hmm. it seems like there's nothing happening, that there's no big change. You know, Indiana Jones doesn't stop being Indiana Jones by the end. Mm -hmm. Watch carefully, and there is. Yeah, every single one, at least the original <laughs> trilogy in particular, yeah. I and mean, even in the new one, he he does evolve. He evolves a little bit. Yeah, like he he like uh, uh, Last Crusade is a great example where he's got all these hangups about his father, and by the end, he he's, is he's becomes closer to his father. Yeah. Uh, uh, Temple he, he, of Doom is about how he's actually an archaeologist who only gives a shit about money at that point in his career, mm-hmm. and about him growing as a character by and, the and, end and of it. giving up the the prize. Like he doesn't yeah. he doesn't need it anymore. He it's, realizes some things are too sacred to be touched. He, there is a little bit of a change there. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. And and Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think it's a little subtler, but it's mm-hmm. by the end of that movie, he's willing to blow something up. He's mm-hmm. willing to destroy a piece of history in order to save things. Now mm-hmm. he he does evolve. Yeah. But yeah. you don't have to evolve he in he, every single way. But if you don't go through something, you kind of don't need to be there. Yeah. And so I, I think when people say, oh, I'd rather just see the characters get into adventure as well, maybe the change isn't huge and dramatic. But if you're paying you know, close attention to where they were at the end of the movie, mm-hmm. as opposed to where they were at the beginning, you'll find that there is some development. And as critics, we're tuned into that, I guess, a little bit, ostensibly. We're a little bit more tuned into that than than we would have been were we not critics. And uh, when a critic says there wasn't enough character development, it just means that they noticed that they were underdeveloped. Right. That there either wasn't a change or there perhaps was, but it seemed contrived or it wasn't big enough. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it's like uh, it's like what I was saying before. Mm. Uh, we have to be honest about our opinions, but we also have to explain as critics. We can't... You know, if you're not a critic, you can say you liked it, you didn't like it, and mm. no one cares. As a critic, we have to say, I liked it for these reasons, or I didn't like it for these reasons. And if you're finding yourself not really engaging, if you're kind of bored with the narrative, it's because it's not doing enough. And yeah. you have to say what's wrong. And if what's wrong is the characters aren't well-developed enough to go through a meaningful experience, and that's why I don't care what happens to them, because they don't change or evolve, and I didn't need to watch this at all... That's the reason. Mm. So it's it might be endemic to a lot of the movies that we're seeing lately. Then again, I'm not sure exactly which movies you're talking about. So right. maybe maybe or, I disagree. Or, maybe or which I... or which critics you're talking about? Like yeah. which which films are they criticizing? And they're yeah. saying that there wasn't enough development, or there was too much, or that they're they're criticizing a film that you enjoyed, and you know the the character development wasn't an issue for you, yeah. but it was for them. Well, I would love to know which films you're talking yeah. about. A story is just a catalog of something mm. that changed, and yeah. oftentimes people change. Mm. I know it seems like they don't. But we do, and mm. we do sometimes in really dramatic ways. Sometimes we do it really slowly over time, and some mm. movies are about that. Um, and most stories have characters in them, and most characters, as they go through a story that's interesting enough to tell a story about, mm. will evolve a bit. Yeah. And that's why we talk about character development a lot. And that's mm. why not having it can be frustrating. Mm. There you go. Um, a good example of this, uh, somebody pointed out to me, another critic, uh, about mm. The Little Mermaid. Uh, if you the the Disney version of it, the 1989 film, sure, ninety eighty nine around there, um, the Little Mermaid. If you look at the character, uh, the main character, the mermaid herself, uh, she at the beginning of the movie she wants something. She wants to become human. She longs to become human so she can a experience something more than her boring life because she has that sort of teenage restlessness, but also so she can fall in love. She's fallen in love with a, a human man. Uh, she sells her her voice she is transformed she goes up onto the the surface and it was all she it turns out she was just a pawn in this big ruse by the villainess to sort of take over the world mm-hmm. and by the end she turns back into a mermaid and she's learned nothing 
<laughs> and it and her father ends up transforming her into a into a human again, so she can marry the man of her dreams. I disagree with and, that. And if you well, if you look at it from this perspective, who makes the big change? It turns out it's the father, yeah. who at the beginning was really doting and wanted to hang on to his daughters, learning to let go of of her, learning that she has a little bit more agency than he assumed she did. Mm-hmm. And it's the father who's making the big change, and it's his story. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, because I mm. haven't seen Little Mermaid in a really long time. Okay. At the end, though, mm. she does choose to go back in the water at an important moment, right? No. She never She never gets her... She never becomes a mermaid again because it's important that no, she like does she, so? No, like, she almost, like... I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think she made any sort of decision to be turned back into a mermaid. Oh, okay, because I thought it was a matter I, of... Ha- it was a matter of values hmm. and evolving out of sort of wish fulfillment. Into no, the, 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 the witch took her hostage and the father Someone's... signed over his, his soul to... Anyway... All right. Again, Someone's, it's been a while since someone, I've seen that okay. one. Okay, maybe this was a bad example because we haven't seen the movie in a while. Yeah. If you're writing us an email about The Little Mermaid, <laughs> okay, but okay. we're not going to read a bunch of them. No. <laughs> okay. We'll read we'll, one or two. We'll read one or two if do, we have Do to. you want to read one more? Let's read one or two All more. Right. Uh, this, this one has come from somebody who's calling himself Green Lobster. Nice. Hello, Green Lobster. Uh, hey, guys. So, I hate to be that guy, but I didn't love Wonder Woman or Black Panther. Okay. That's your prerogative. I actually found them to be pretty flawed movies. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed both films to a certain extent. I found Black Panther to be pretty good, and I found Wonder Woman to be a decently enjoyable movie. But I feel that these films were extraordinarily overhyped. In the case of Black Panther, so overhyped that it could have been great, and it still could have been overhyped. I hate to be that guy again, but I feel the cultural importance overshadowed some major flaws with both films. Wonder Woman suffered from a horrible third act, agreed, and an even worse villain. I don't think it had a horrible third act, I think it had a bad climax. It had a bad climax, a climax that kind of undid messages it it was was trying to get across. I think that's an exaggeration, but okay, I see what your point is, go on. Um, And Black Panther's most interesting and compelling character, Killmonger, wasn't in half of the movie, and most of the action was weak at best. Yeah, some of the climax in that movie was... I I liked it fine, but okay. Um, I I disagree. I think Black Panther's actually a really interesting character, but Also, Also, the what are those joke is one of the worst moments in any of the Marvel films. I don't remember Uh, when When uh, uh, Black Panther's sister is commenting that he's wearing sandals. Oh, okay. And so I don't, what it's a very minor moment. I don't really see it as right. a thing, but okay. Uh, I'm not saying that the people who love these films aren't being genuine, but when I see people outraged that Wonder Woman wasn't nominated for Best Picture and that Black Panther is one of the best comic book films ever made, I can't help but think that some are overreacting. Both films aren't terrible and indeed culturally important, but I wonder how audiences would react to them in a decade or two from now once we have some distance. Keep up the work, guys. It's hard to guess mm. where people are going to be at a movie in 10 years, especially culturally, mm. because cultures shift. Values shift. Um, value shifted really sharply rather recently, in case you hadn't noticed, mm. for the better, I think. <laughs> um, so it's hard to predict that. Mm-hmm. And we can't really do that. Oftentimes we just have to deal with what yeah. we have right now and what we've had in the past. Yeah. Um, a movie like Wonder Woman and Black Panther uh, feel incredibly forward and progressive mm. and exciting There's- in their sheer existence. And I think on top of that, I think it's, you even admit, they're good movies. I would argue they're great movies, but certainly they're at least good movies. I think a lot of people can agree on that. Some people might not. On some level, art is merely subjective. But uh, when people are so excited about something, to have it now, you can call that hype if you want. You can also just say, holy crap, we're really appreciative. Yeah, well, there's been a a really uh, rather terrific movement recently for uh, equal representation. Mm-hmm. Of, of all groups in not just film, because groups have always been represented in film. Not equally. But not, well. Not even remotely. Not even remotely equally, especially when it comes to, like, the ones with the big budgets, the ones that are put out by major studios, the ones that are seen by the most numbers of people. Um, like, gay people didn't show up in movies for a long time unless you were floating around the fringes. There was a lot of queer cinema going on throughout film history. Right. But it was always way off to the side. Mm-hmm. And it created, you know, subcultures and cult films, and those are all great movies. And that's a great world to immerse yourself in. Mm-hmm. Um, and in order to do that, you kind of have to give a middle finger to all that mainstream garbage that's coming out with all the straight white guys over and over and over again. And it wasn't only until recently that those big budget movies are finally getting equal representation a little bit more. Yeah. It's only a start right now, but we're finally getting it a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, people have been clamoring and, it for forever, but there's a really concerted movement to make it happen. Ma- right to now, actually make great. it happen now. And we're yeah. getting films by black filmmakers and and films about Wonder Woman that are just you know putting wo- women in the 
same place where men have already been for decades. Uh, case in point, uh, Ocean's 8 opens Ocean, this weekend. Yeah, See go. it, it's really good. So when people are sort of responding, they're responding to that just as much as they're responding to the quality of the film. Now you're saying, should we just look at the film itself and, and ignore the cultural impact it's having? Yes and no. There's two ways to look at that. Yes, when you're writing a review, you should be looking at this film and criticizing any small flaws that you could have, mm -hmm. but you should also be acknowledging the bigger picture that it's a contributing to. Yeah, there was art a is big, part of a culture. Yeah, it's not so, separate from it. It actually exists within it and interacts um, with it. Uh, a, a big case for me was the Ghostbusters remake. Mm. A lot of people were really, really high on the Ghostbusters remake because here is a big, dumb comedy, big budget, made by high-profile filmmakers, put out by a big-budget studio, starring all women. And, and it's a remake of a known classic. So this is really, really forward. I saw the movie, and I hate it. I don't like that movie. <laughs> okay. And I think it's important to acknowledge, and this is something I've had to kind of grapple with, that a film can be really important and an important part of the conversation, even if you think it sucks. Okay. All right. I like a, that movie more than you do, a, so fair enough. A, ba but. a bad film can Look. be important. So even if you're not really high on these films that you admitted you liked, Wonder Woman and Black Panther, it, it's important to acknowledge the things that people are seeing in this and the things that it is doing mm -hmm. in order to uh, sort of yeah. be a little bit more socially conscious in addition to where it stands technically. It's, it's a fallacy to say that because something is popular or hyped that it is therefore good. However... If it is popular, genuinely popular, mm -hmm. and people are talking about it, and it is part of a zeitgeist, mm -hmm. it's doing something right. Yeah. It might not be the most obvious thing, but something about it is really connecting with people. And as critics, it's our responsibility to figure out what that is mm -hmm. and talk about that. Um, but when it comes to like how, how will history look, and it's easier when we look back at films and say, well, at the time this was mm. daring and now it doesn't feel that way. American beauty. <clears throat> we'll get there. Yeah. That's what history is for. We'll, we'll get there. And we can try to analyze it and try to be as progressive as possible and forward and say to ourselves, here's what works, here's what doesn't work. But you don't need to jump the gun. You can look at it right now. Mm. And then eventually we will look back at it and it might surprise you. Black Panther might age insanely well, mm. you know, I, and like and I, other it, movies know, and might age really, really badly. That seemed really good right now. It, it, it happens. There's going to be a, a, a point, like maybe in four years, where we might be having the conversation. Remember when Black Panther seemed really important? And it just doesn't anymore. Be and and, that, and the only reason that would be is because mm. Black Panther was important, mm. and, it, and other movies got made that eventually even overshadowed Black Panther. Yeah, that's yeah. the only way that could happen. So then it is important. Mm. These, it's it's very interesting to look back at historical context, and I like that you're thinking about historical context. I think it's great. I think you just might have overshot it a little bit. <laughs> I try to think of contemporary context and try to think that like this hype exists for a reason and the reason people are so excited by this is because the movies are doing something right mm. there have been a lot of attempts oh. to make movies like Wonder Woman mm. that did not hit just recently for example Tomb Raider it's a really good action movie with a female lead and it hits a lot of the same notes people just didn't respond mm. to it very much and I think in addition to people responding to what the film is doing and you know Going back to Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters did something. It had uh, women as scientists doing scientific things and having adventures, which is something you don't see in movies a lot. A lot. It was really bad. I uh, disagree it, with it, that well, point, well, but okay. okay. And it also wasn't a big hit. It was not a big hit. It wasn't a big it hit. It did okay, but it, it was not a it hit. It did okay. It wasn't a big hit. Another film that featured a bunch of very strong, complex female characters who were all scientists who did something very, very well and something very profound and something very strange was Annihilation. Yep. That came out earlier this year. Mm -hmm. A far better film than Ghostbusters, I would say. Mm -hmm. But it didn't get nearly the hype because it wasn't one of those huge successes. And I think... We're in an, a weird era where we're really hyper aware of how a film's financial success yeah. is leaking out into the culture at large and how we feel that a fi something that is financially successful, that is a big hit, is going to be more important than uh, films that aren't financial hits. Mm -hmm. And as film history goes on, maybe in 10 years' time, Annihilation will be considered you know, as revolutionary as it is. Mm -hmm. But people aren't talking about, it right, talking about it right now. Not on mass, anyway. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I think we're also looking at this interesting period right now where a lot of the movies that we're seeing are, like Ocean's 8, for example, something that existed before, but now it is being made more inclusive. Mm. And with that, like, again, Annihilation, it's an adaptation, but it's not an adaptation of a best-selling work. Mm-hmm. Like, that everyone's aware of, like, Harry Potter or something. So, it flew under a lot of radars, but something like Wonder Woman or Ghostbusters gets a lot of attention. Be- well, Wonder Woman isn't reevaluating, mm-hmm. but Ghostbusters is. Mm-hmm. Ghostbusters is taking something that was about men, <laughs> man jobs, and now it is uh, about women in mm-hmm. those roles. There's there's an additional cachet to that, mm-hmm. where we're kind of just saying, hey, you know how, like, dudes were in control of everything for forever? They didn't have to be. Right. Um, and so we're seeing that. We're seeing that with all of like a lot of like more inclusive Star Wars movies. Like, hey, there's a whole huge universe. It's not mostly white people out there. There's actually like all <laughs> kinds of people and characters out there. And, there, and women had cool stuff to do too, besides Leia. Like, there's a, like there's a great line uh, uh, from Fry and Futurama, where he's, he's actually talking about Star Trek, but he's saying Star Trek taught me to get along with all kinds of of strange people, whether they were Klingon or alien or gaseous or even female. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it was yeah. really kind of behind the times yeah, in a yeah. lot of ways. They were trying, they failed, but like, you know, they were, they were, moving. they were staggering slowly forward. Yeah, and that's all we're doing, really, is we're staggering <laughs> slowly forward. I, I, my advice is sort of let people have the excitement, don't worry about it. Mm. Um, and yeah, if you have legit critiques, okay. Don't let this, don't let hype. Here's the thing when you worry about hype, what you're really, really worried about is how excited other people are about something and what other people think about it. Popular, uh, this sort of vague, amorphous pop opinion Mm -hmm. rather than the opinions of the people you know personally. And it's easy to get like locked into that Mm -hmm. and just be sort of like, oh, and everyone's wrong but me. Mm -hmm. I've done that myself. I'm not proud of it. We we, we still kind of internalize that. It's hard not to, but like we have to try. And so my advice is don't worry about that. Mm. You know, we're all going to like some things more than other things, and and that's okay. Let people enjoy it, let them have their fun, and let people be inspired by the things that inspire them. Because I'm sure mm. there's something that inspires you and everyone else listening to this podcast that other people don't get mm. or don't appreciate as much as you do. That doesn't make it any less special. Um, I think those movies are great. Mm-hmm. Whitney finds critiques with a lot of them. That's fair too. Yeah, um, I, I didn't respond to Wonder Woman the same way a lot of people did. I, I think I'm on uh, the same page as you, reader, on on Wonder Woman. I, I enjoyed Wonder Woman. I thought it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, Black Panther, I kind of lost my mind over. <laughs> Black Panther I, I is really, fucking amazing. I, I really love Black Panther. Black Panther is fucking amazing. I think Wonder Woman. There are some storytelling critiques in there, but I think overall, what it accomplishes is mm. absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think I feel the same way about Ghostbusters. I, I, sadly, I don't think the jokes play as well the second time I watched it. But Aww. I still love the characters so much. The character mm. Kate McKinnon plays is unlike almost <laughs> any other character I've seen in in, in movies. This mm. sort of introverted extrovert. And I love that character. I love seeing her get to kick butt and not have it be sexualized. I think that's yeah. something that's so fucking rare Here, that it was really just thrilling to see something that different. Here, here's how you and on f- top of it, I like the story Here, fine. Here's how you fix that Ghostbusters. Just her. <laughs> get rid of the other three. They're all dead weight. Oh, I like them. <laughs> actually, Leslie Jones was like the... Leslie her, Jones her, her and Leslie Jones. Just the two of them. I like them all. We actually don't need Kristen Wiig and, and Ms. L- Ms. I, Melissa McCarthy. You can get them out of the movie. I like them all fine. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, so that's it for this episode of Critically Acclaimed. Thank you, everybody. Uh, don't forget, you can write in letters at criticallyacclaimed.net. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at William Bibiani. I'm at Whitney Seibel. Uh, you can read our stuff at criticallyacclaimed.net. That's a hub where you can see all of our various appearances, podcasts, reviews, links to reviews from other sites, mm-hmm. original review content, essays, and the like. Um, we'll be back next week with reviews of... Uh, yeah, the, uh, you said already. Incredibles, Incredibles 2, Tag, tag Superfly. Yeah. Uh, go to Schmoville exclamation point on Facebook to vote for the quote-unquote bad movie you want us to review next week, and we'll come up with a good movie yeah. to pair along with it. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and never forget, everyone's a critic. I want to go to the Midnight Show. I'm sorry, what? <laughs>